to say, come out and vote. And by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning and welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. We're on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live all the way from 10 until 1. Coming up in this hour, US President Joe Biden has warned Iran not to attack Israel and said America's commitment to Israel's security was ironclad. And with warnings that an Iranian retaliation to the killing of an Iranian general in Syria could be imminent. Meanwhile, tougher new rules on spousal visas come into force today. Citizens will need to earn at least £29,000 a year to bring their husbands or wives into the UK. That's up from £18,600. Home Secretary says the changes will protect British workers, but some critics argue it will punish families. And the NHS has been ordered to reveal the fate of 9,000 children who underwent transgender treatment at the controversial Tavistock Clinic in London. Health Secretary Victoria Atkins has slammed a culture of secrecy and ideology over evidence and safety after the landmark CAS review called for an end to rushing children into changing their gender and a ban on puberty blockers for under-18s. A little bit later on that, we're going to be talking to Graham Linehan, a man who lost his job, his career, his income and even his marriage over standing up for women and children. Can't wait to talk to him. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Emily Rose Adams. Good morning. The man police arrested over the fatal stabbing of a mum in Bradford while she was walking her baby in a pram has been charged with murder. Habiba Masoom was also charged with possession of a knife. He's appearing in court shortly. Our correspondent Nick Ellaby is there. The facts of this case that we know so far is that Habiba Masoom, who's 25, known to be a resident of Burnley, will appear at Bradford Magistrates Court behind me later this morning, charged with murder and possession of a bladed article. It follows the killing of Kulsuma Akta, who was 27. A uh, cousin of Miss Akta's has described her as loving, caring, humble, and also having a gift to make people laugh. And her mother, who's living in Bangladesh, is reported to be constantly crying. The US president has vowed support for Israel amid threats by Iran to retaliate for this month's deadly strike on its consulate in Syria. Joe Biden said the US's commitment to Israel is ironclad and that it will do all it can to protect Israel's security. Well, it comes as the Israeli military says it's killed three of the sons of Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh. All of them worked for the Hamas military. They're among the highest profile targets to be killed in Gaza so far. One person has been killed and five others injured, including two children, after gunmen opened fire in a residential area of Washington, D.C. Investigators believe the suspects left a car and began shooting at people on the street. Police have issued a public alert for the car that fled the scene. We are working v tirelessly to, to really help remove some of these illegal guns that are on our streets. We're working with our ATFs. We're working with some of our task force. Uh, what we're seeing is an increase of guns in the district, and we're doing everything we can to ensure that we're removing those guns off of our streets. The Metropolitan Police will reinvestigate why it charged TV presenter Caroline Flack due to possible new evidence. The TV star was facing prosecution for assaulting her boyfriend when she took her own life in 2020. A coroner ruling said she feared the publicity a trial would attract. Well, the CPS had said Caroline should only get a caution, but the Met appealed it and she was then charged. Flack's mother has repeatedly criticised how police handled the case. Nearly half of NHS staff are looking for a new job outside of the service. Figures released today found 47% of people have spent time looking at job adverts to leave the NHS, while around a third had actively inquired about it. Well, former NHS Trust Chair Roy Lilly has told Talk TV he's not surprised. We're seeing a lot of youngsters now who once went into nursing because they sort of wanted a, a job for life. It was a career. Now they're saying, you know what, I want a job and a life. And a lot of them are leaving the NHS. 
And a once-a-day pill to treat migraines has been given the green light on the NHS in England, which could help to relieve symptoms in more than 170,000 people. The medication will be an option for frequent sufferers who've tried at least three other treatments without success. But there are calls this morning for the life-changing pill to be made more accessible on the NHS as quickly as possible. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazneen Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's finally looking warm and bright across much of the UK for this afternoon. Not everywhere, though. Along southern areas of England, mainly around the south coast, it will be murky, cloudy, and there will be some patchy light rain and drizzle. But everywhere else, some good spells of sunshine, largely dry as well, and above average temperatures. We could locally see highs of 19 to 20 degrees Celsius, this most likely around the East Midlands towards East Anglia. But as I said, everywhere seeing above average temperatures. Overnight then, and we start to see rain spreading across Ireland, Northern Ireland, the north and west of England, and Wales and over at Scotland as well. It will turn a bit blustery across these parts, but the winds are coming from a southwesterly direction, a mild airflow, so it remains mild overnight everywhere with temperatures in at double figures once again. And then for tomorrow, it's more of a northwest southeast divide, and it's the north and west seeing the unsettled conditions with showery rain at times across Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and parts of Northern England at first, particularly to the northwest. But the rest of England and Wales seeing some good spells of sunshine, and there will be mainly dry conditions there. Warm again with the highest temperature of the year so far possible in the southeast at up to 22 degrees Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer and you are with Talk TV. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, joining me also here in the studio, running through all the biggest stories of the day, is former senior military intelligence officer, Philip Ingram. Good morning. Uh, good morning to you. Well, given that we want to talk about possible, you know, attack from Iran on Israel and goodness knows, World War Three breaking out, small matter on a Thursday morning. We like to keep to the light stories yeah, That'll be next show. week. That'll yeah. be next week. Oh, great. <laughs> That's always encouraging. <laughs> you know, batten down the hatches, folks. Um, start doing your prepping. Um, I do want to talk to you first, though, but it's always good to have you on on days like this, um, about the latest NHS waiting list figures uh, that came out at 9.30. And they show that, yay, yay, let's get very excited, get the cocktails out. The waiting list for routine hospital treatment in England has fallen for the fifth month in a row. Good news for the health secretary, good news for the prime minister. He said he wanted to get uh, those uh, health waiting lists down. However, we're still looking at an estimated 7.54 million treatments um but that's pretty much almost 7.54 million patients but some people will be waiting uh, for more than one uh, thing uh, and that was uh, th th that's at the end of february i mean it's a huge it's a huge 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 uh, number of treatments uh, uh, being waited for um the list hit a record high back last september with 7.77 million treatments and six and a half million patients um it is now still routine that i, mean, it's, I find this astonishing a third of people on an urgent cancer referral don't start any treatment and don't get uh, don't get anything done for the first two months mm. after that referral. That's for urgent referral from your mm. GP. I find that astonishing. And if you think that is what's happening in Western, rest of Western Europe or even Eastern Europe, that is amazing. The question I'm asking our audience today, and I'd love to know what you think, Philip, is with these hospital waiting lists falling for a fifth month in a row, are you confident that your family can get the health care they need? Tell us your experience where they have or they haven't. Some people have very good stories. Some people have very worrying stories waiting uh, for a long time for treatment. We know 250 people are believed to be dying in England every single week uh, simply from waiting in A&E. Give us a call. Uh, 0344 499 1000 is the number to call. Text on 8722. Or you can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text cost one standard network rate message. Um, Philip, um, you've spoken before about having mm. cancer treatment and, and mm -hmm. quite timely treatment on the NHS. But um, um, are you confident that people can get the treatment they or their families need? It's a postcode lottery. That's the trouble. Yeah. And therefore, if it's a postcode lottery and you get some really good treatment in some parts of the country and really poor treatment in hospitals next door, yeah. that's not down to a funding issue or, or anything else issue. That's down to an overall management issue, whether it be that from NHS level down into hospital levels of management. Yeah. Um, am I confident? No. Um, the biggest problem is actually getting that over that first step and it's getting the GP appointment. Yeah. You know, I've, I've had some recent treatment 
and um, I was in a position to get some of it done privately. But uh, that yeah, was but what, most people aren't. Well, well yeah. most, most most people aren't. But that was um, you know I got all of that done before my GP actually could get an appointment or get find time to come and see me. That's, um, yeah, or, or that's give time for me to come to see, see Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, yeah, being, a bit, exactly. being a bit picky there, asking yeah. to be... I, mean, I have to say, I mean, I've got no issues getting a GP appointment or getting responses. It's just all electronic now. I don't really... Unless it's something very important, I don't really mm. uh, feel the need to go in. It saves time for me, saves time for the doctor, yep. the receptionist, tick, tick on all boxes. But people who do need to see, we're hearing again and again, people queuing around the block. Yeah. Uh, to try and get into a GP appointment. And often I think, well, I live in London, so I say, well, I'll just move to another GP surgery. There are yeah. plenty about. Yeah. Actually, for a lot of people, there is only one local GP surgery. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's getting that balance right. And, and this is where you know, people talk about, uh, when politicians are talking about, they're getting the priorities wrong. They talk about you know, the, the privatisation of the NHS, and this is terrible, we have to protect it. Yeah. Well, you know, our GPs are all... They're private they're, contracts. They're pri pri private contracts that come in, as our, our pharmacies, our opticians, our dentists. Mm. You know, the the second um, secondary care in hospitals, Hospitals is is what's owned by uh, by, by, by the government. I, but, I, but it I don't matter. care. I, yes, I don't care who do it. And again, there's lots of people. It's very about political ideology. We talk a lot about political ideology, don't we? Do we? And how that gets in the way <laughs> of, of getting things done in this country. Um, and I do want to come on to obviously the NHS and the CAS report uh, as well. But first, let's also talk about. I say, do get in touch. I want to hear your health experiences. Good or bad, and just whether you actually feel confident. Do you actually feel confident that the NHS is going to be there for you in your hour of need? Maybe you've had an hour of need in the last, you know, month. Uh, what's happened there? Do you get in touch? Um, I particularly want to get to you on the phones. 03444991000 is that number to call. Um, let's talk, though, about, uh, well, no doubt, uh, more phone calls between Joe Biden and the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin mm. Netanyahu. Uh, last night, Joe Biden promised Israel ironclad US yeah. support uh, amid fears that Tehran uh, could launch reprisals against Israel in imminently, there's the mm. word we've used, um, after an attack on April the 1st that killed uh, senior Iranian generals and others. Um, look, Israel would have known, if you attack you know, the Iranian embassy, you know, generals and Iranians in Syrians, um, embassy in Syria, you, this, of course, is, there is going to be mm. retaliation. But there's been quite a strong feeling that Iran, while busy funding Hamas and Hezbollah and the Houthi rebels and everyone else, and a lot of sabre rattling, doesn't want a, a, a oh. Middle Eastern war and has actually been very sort of quite much more controlled than perhaps some people might have been expected. What sort of retaliation would we expect? Um, you know, Iran usually responds in a measured way. It, it takes its time. It doesn't have a knee-jerk reaction. Um, and the commander that they killed was the IRGC overall commander Revolutionary with, Guard, yeah. with responsibility for Syria, for um, operations into Israel um, through, through the Palestinians, um, Iraq and elsewhere. Um, it's not just the Israelis that, that kill IRGC commanders, the Americans do it as well. Um, Iran could respond in a number of different ways. It could fire missiles from Iran to Israeli targets directly um, using Iranian military. Or what it could do is use its proxies that it's got across the Middle East, in particular Hez Hezbollah um, from Lebanon and um, other different groups operating out of Iraq and elsewhere. And of course, we've got the Houthis in Yemen who've been firing ballistic missiles and cruise missiles um, up towards Israel. Uh, Iran is more likely to use a number of its proxies initially and see how that goes, see what the reaction is, yeah. um, and then follow it up with something else. Because they know, at the end of the day, that as much as the US have been critical of Israel on the treatment of civilians in, in Gaza uh, and, uh, and, and their actions generally since October the 7th, and we've seen that falling away of Western support, again, how predictable, because in the West we don't understand these battles, these, mm -hmm. these big you know, ideological battles that we're in. Um, but if it came to Iran, you know, the great, you know, axis of evil, um, if, if Iran um, uh, attacked Israel, that's a different... We're talking about a completely Co different uh, yeah, yeah, size, sizable event. Co completely different. And you know, the, the United States and a lot of other countries are, are watching what Iran's doing very closely. And Iran's relationships with other actors around the world, in particular um, Vladimir Putin in Russia, but also relations into uh, Xi Jinping in China and um, Kim Jong-un in North Korea. Um, so there's, there's real concern building up about that um, axis of different um, global leaders who are not necessarily following uh, rules-based society um, and can think in multi-generational terms. 
Um, and of course, our leaders are, being, are focused very, focusing very much on the elections that are happening this year. So yeah, absolutely. getting those statements out. Absolutely. We know there are sort of internal battles in the Democrat Party uh, uh, as well, aren't there? Uh, we shall see what happens and obviously fears of reprisals. And again, there will be a sort of a, an element of a tit for tat that will be deemed sort of be diplomatically acceptable. Yes. Um, uh, you know, uh, and... and, and, if, and uh, if, if using big explosive devices is ever yeah. diplomatically acceptable. Well, yeah, well, you know, you know yeah. all sides do it, don't they? Yeah. Um, let's also talk uh, uh, about uh, Julian Assange. Um, there is some talk that... Uh, um, that started by Joe Biden, uh, that he considering abandoning the Julian Assange extradition case. Could we talk about this uh, with a guest a little bit later on the show? But this comes after the Australian Prime Minister, who, of course, uh, Julian Assange is Australian, uh, is Albanese. He basically said, look, you know, the US government needs to drop this. Whatever has, you know, Julian Assange has done, you know, he didn't commit a crime. He was, a, you know, he claims he was a journalist, that he, you know, that he has served enough time either in the Ecuadorian embassy or behind bars. Is it four years now in Belmarsh? He uh, shouldn't be extradited to the United States. This has been a long, protracted uh, process, part in part because, of course, we need to get uh, assurances that there won't be the death penalty and, and things like that. Julian Assange faces, faces life behind bars, you know, dying behind bars. Um, but Joe Biden answering a question yesterday, you never know with Joe Biden well, whether, exactly. he's, whether he's just, you know, that's the thing with someone you think has dementia, uh, being the le leader of the free world, yeah. basically saying that they are considering this case. Well, I hope they consider it and then, really then, and, 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 then, and then turn around and go ahead with their prosecution because, you know, Julian Assange... He, he's got so many journalist accreditations behind his name that all appeared after he released everything from on WikiLeaks. If there'd been any editorial control over what um, he'd released in the first place, the, only the key bits that were holding um, uh, governments to account would have come out, not everything. And because of the totality of what he put out, the damage that that has caused, the amount of terrorism it's enabled, the amount of espionage it's enabled, the number of agents that will have been killed in different countries around the world is huge. Yeah. Nobody will ever be able to turn around that, and say, these, these, are, no, these but, are the numbers. No, but, the, but that's the interesting thing, of course, because of, in, in some of the court documents, the, the, they haven't actually, the US hasn't actually released who they, who they believe has been killed, but then, of course, they wouldn't, would they? Well, exactly, and but, that, that could be one of the considerations it's yeah. a very usual consideration. You know, mess someone around as much as possible, and then when it comes to prosecution, drop it because what you don't want to do is give away yeah. um, your. Yeah, as is often sources. the case. Let's also talk about going back to the healthcare service. The, the CAS report yesterday, the big review, um, a four-year review by you know a leading paediatrician, former president of the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, um, uh, Hilary Cass into what is going on with treatment of yeah. children who believe they are trans. There's such thing as a trans child, remember? Um, and um, the Health Secretary, Victoria Atkins, has uh, demanded that NHS clinics report on the long-term outcomes mm -hmm. for the 9,000 young people who were treated as trans patients at the Tavistock Clinic. It's extraordinary, the report, actually, you know, the number of clinics that were treating uh, uh, yeah, children, and this is only looking at children, just simply refusing to comply, refusing to give any yeah. information. And certainly there have been no long-term studies into what happens later on. Do they suffer from further mental health problems? We know, you know, the suicide rate, um, uh, do want to, people wanting to detransition, uh, people's mm -hmm. problems with infertility, um, you know, uh, damage, you know, bone cancer is one of the outcomes of starting puberty blockers so, so young, and brain development, it, all of these things. Um, and it's extraordinary these experimental drugs were given without knowledge of what the long-term outcomes were, and it would appear total lack of care from the Tavistock staff about what those long-term impacts could be. Um, it is absolutely vital that these clinics come clean with all the information they have, and if they don't have it, seek it out. Yeah, 100%. And you're those medical professionals that ignored the Hippocratic Oath, which within that oath, it turns around and says, um, you know, any treatment is not automatically drugs or surgery. You know, they seem to go drugs or surgery. Yeah. They were experimenting on children. You know, that's child abuse in my mind. But again, I've said it all along, you know, you, you know when you have a kid and they say, oh, half, an, half a paracetamol maximum. Oh, but here are some puberty blockers. Yeah. It is absolutely extraordinary this allowed to happen. I also find extraordinary the number of people who were happy to call people like me transphobes, you know, J.K. Rowling and, and Helen Joyce and Maya Forstetter and Kate Barker and Graham Linehan, who we're going to talk to in about 20 minutes' time. So many people who were speaking out on these sort of issues, James Dreyfus, people who lost what... I mean, I'm very lucky, you know. You can call me a transphobe as much as you want. I don't care. I know I'm not. I, I, but I do care about about uh, about children in particular being safe from uh, political ideologies. But the Stonewalls, the Mermaids mm -hmm. pushing for all of this, the Labour Party 
massively supportive of oh, not, not, not of this. today the, 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 not, you turned yeah but but not today well let's have a little let's have a watch and a listen of a clip um of Wes Streeting I've got a lot of time for Wes Streeting Shadow Health Secretary uh, he's been very sound in a lot of this stuff actually given you know given his party but when you saw people like Labour MP Rosie Duffield yeah. just the abuse that she had no support uh, and basically you know these the Labour Party basically could you know Keir Starmer saying nonsense things like trans women are women and 99.9% uh, yeah. uh, of women don't have a penis, but 0.1%. Uh, I mean, just nonsense stuff. Um, this is an interview that Wes Streeting did uh, with Harry Cole, who's the editor of The Sun, uh, on the Sun's that never mind at the ballots uh, uh, broadcast. Um, let's have a watch and a listen of, of this conversation. They ran a campaign saying trans women, are trans, trans women are women, get over it. Do you agree with that? Mm, uh, no, it's to the extent that, look, uh, and I say this with some self-criticism and reflection, if you'd asked me a few years ago uh, uh, on this topic, I would have said, trans men are men, trans women are women, some people are trans, get over it, let's move on, this is, this is all uh, blown out of proportion. And now I sort of is sit and reflect and think, actually, there are lots of complexities Isn't that the problem, that leading today? figures like yourself, and I'm not just singling you out, but leading figures like yourself were saying, get over it, no, when people, were trying, to, like, when people right. were trying to raise the facts. So you regret, no, I think you have regret. I absolutely take the criticism on the chin. It's actually really nice to hear a politician saying, yeah, I, I, I think I, I, you know, I was wrong. But I'm fascinated, you know, BBC, Sky, all these people have been, organisations, been pushing this ideology and telling people like me and many, many, many others who've, who've done far more um, to speak out on this issue, that we're all transphobes and bigots. Oh, oh, all changed your tune today, have you? Well, yeah, and that's, that's the trouble. You people latch onto something and that seems to take um, a, a, a momentum all of its own until yeah. then there's proper research uh, and it's looked at and found yeah. wrong and people then change yeah. their minds. They really it's good was... to see a politician changing his yeah, mind. Always, always give credit. And actually, he's been pretty sound on a lot of this stuff as they go. Yeah. But it generally, for me, it's just, you know, the idea that politicians just go with what they think is the... What's the, what's the perceived dinner party approved conversation What'll and What'll get me tomorrow's happened. vote. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, it was just, you know, what happened to actually, like, thinking about it yourself and morality and... and and honesty and just I, I just find it absolutely extraordinary and I'm still quite across about this thing the toxicity of the debate that Hillary Cass talked about clearly talking about how people couldn't speak out there's only been one side that's been toxic the side I've been on yeah. um, the side people you know we, we you know we've just been trying to stand up for women's rights and for children's safety yeah. that, that's not a toxic debate I've not been calling anyone names the, the minority trying to impose their views on the majority and the majority scared to talk out about it that yeah. uh, in other ways is defined Pe as terrorism yeah people losing their jobs or being you know, you know, basically sort of non-person because they speak out about abuse of children. You live in a crazy, messed yeah. up world if that yeah. is what's going on. Anyway, we talked about that an awful lot uh, yesterday and that's what's been going on in our beloved, wonderful, praise be NHS. It was that lot doing it, by the way, until some of these people are actually... If, you didn't, if they didn't actually, you know, actually comply with the uh, uh, CAS report uh, and, and demand for information... They should be sacked on the spot, bye-bye, mm -hmm. out of a job and, and, frankly, prosecuted. But in terms of wider healthcare, I want to ask you today about NHS hospital waiting lists. They have fallen for a fifth uh, month in a row. 7.54 million treatments still being waited for by 6.5 million patients now left waiting for that treatment. I want to know, are you confident that your family can get the healthcare they need? Tell us your experience, whether good whether bad. Give us a call 0344 499 1000. Text on 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Fiona has done just that and says, I've given up trying to be treated. I think most people aren't bothering anymore. Yeah, people who aren't bothering are the people who then end up dying of cancer, by the way, because they don't get treatment in a timely fashion. Go to the doctor. Mark says, I can honestly say that I've never felt like I've had bad treatment from the NHS. I've had to wait a week or two for a doctor's appointment for non-urgent things. If you need to see someone because you're properly ill, then you can usually get to see someone within three days. Get, it's the idea that in this country, in a first world country, sixth richest country in the world, you think that waiting two weeks for a hospital appointment or when you're seriously ill, three days for a doctor's appointment is acceptable. Wow. I mean, wow. That is terrifying to me. Uh, and Darren says, are they accounting for the deceased in these drop-in numbers? So, basically, <laughs> as we don't know. No, I mean, that's the thing. We don't know. With A&E, 250 people, there's the Royal College of Emergency Care saying uh, they, they think that 250 people are dying every week because of long waits in A&E. They're just not being treated in time. <sighs> Absolutely extraordinary. Uh, do uh, get in touch on the phones. Uh, let's go to Gloria, who's done just that, who's in London. Hello, Gloria. 
Hello, Julia, my sister from another mister. Um, <laughs> I love that. What do you um, want to say? What's been your experience? And do you trust the NHS to provide care for you and your family? Well, I can't say I, well, I, can't say I do in this instance. Um, I reported a lesion on my left arm that had changed color a couple mm. of times. You know, alarm bells. Yeah. Uh, my GP reluctantly, reluctantly um, said, it took a, had a special photograph done, mm. sent it to the dermatologist, texts me back to say you have Bowen's disease, but it's not cancer. And I thought, fantastic. Okay, yeah. But I, I checked and sure as you know what, uh, Bowen's disease is cancer. Is a Albeit form of cancer. A, so it was just a casual slowly. text. I mean, you got you got response quickly, I suppose. But um, and, and, and yeah, and he then said, it "Will it's a routine appointment? You can have." And I got an appointment for August fifteenth. This was a couple of months ago. Wow. Now, because I'm a loud math American, I don't take stuff like this lying down. I did my research uh, with the wonderful help of Macmillan Cancer. Did my research with NICE, um, which said that my lesion had all the earmarks of somebody who should be seen straight away. Yeah. Still wouldn't budge. Had to get my MP involved. And then finally, um, I now have an appointment next week. Well, thank goodness for that. But this is the thing. Unless you're sharp elbowed, unless you're, let's face it, Gloria, like you and me, um, just like willing to go, nope, not taking no for an answer, then I'm afraid you get treated later. And that's why people, that's why people in this country die of cancer more than they die of cancer in most of Europe. Simple as that. Yeah, and, and my sister, who lives in America um, and is on Medicaid, which is Medicaid, which is treatment for the for the low wage, yep. she gets she gets an appointment straight away and gets yep. to see. Yep a consultant within a week. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. People, again, the message we just had from someone saying like, oh, it is pretty good. You know, I can see someone within three days if it's urgent. I mean, we have just got this completely skewed and people are under the illusion that this is the norm. It is not the norm in most Western countries. I really appreciate your call, Gloria. I um, look forward to seeing you at family Christmas as well. <laughs> I hope that the appointment next week goes well. Coming up after the break, tougher new rules on spousal visas come into force today. The Home Secretary says the changes will protect British workers. Workers. Others argue, though, that it will punish families. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position. But I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late-night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, 
They put them in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was move another on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Now, tougher new rules on spousal visas come into force today. Citizens here will need to earn at least £29,000 a year to bring their husbands or wives into the UK. That's up from 18600 The Home Secretary says that the changes will protect British workers, but some critics argue they'll actually punish families. Well, joining me right now to discuss this is former Home Office advisor Claire Pearsall. Good morning to you, Claire. Nice to see you on the Zoom, although we normally have you here in the studio. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, lovely to see you. Thanks, Thanks for having so. me. Well, I mean, these are, these, this is quite a big change. This is look. This is basically like how much do you yourself, if you're living here as British citizen, have to earn before you're allowed to bring your spouse in? But also, there are lots of rules in terms of what like the spouse will have to earn. But basically, you need to be able to support your other half. Otherwise, there'll be a, a you know claiming benefits or a drain on society. And these figures are extraordinary. From today, Britain's having to earn at least 29 grand a year, up from 18 and a half grand to sponsor a loved one to come and live in the UK. But the wage special is going to go up later this year to £34,500 and then again to £38,700 in early uh, 2025. So certainly by later this year, it's going to be, you have to earn average wage. So anyone on a, you know, below the average wage, you basically can't bring your husband or your wife to come and live here. Is that about protecting British workers, protecting the, the, the welfare state, or is it just keeping families apart? Well, I think that we needed to have a look at the thresholds uh, that 18,600 hadn't changed since uh, approximately about 2012. I think that was originally bought in. And we all know that the cost of living, the cost of housing and providing services has increased. So I think it was only right to look at the increase and 29,000 seems to hit the right note. I think looking at increasing it up to 34,500 and even further will be a stretch too far for the majority of families. And then you start to look at what that does to the fabric of families who want to live and settle in the United Kingdom. They're paying their own way. They're working sometimes in slightly lower paid jobs. So I think it's a fine balancing act, but I don't think it's wrong to have a look at what it takes mm. to uh, be able to afford to live in the United Kingdom with your family, just as the rest yeah. of us have to. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I say, I'm always in two minds on this because the general policy sounds very sensible, but then there will be families who, are, you know, someone goes abroad to work, they fall or travel, they fall in love with someone, but because they earn, you know, under 30 grand or over 30 grand, depends whether they can bring their partner back to live in this country. It seems to me that there shouldn't be a sort of a, a basically a price on falling in love with somebody. So that does feel wrong. And especially at a time when we are handing out hundreds of thousands of visas to people to just come to this country who earn way less than this to come and work as carers, for instance. So we're allowing people to come in. The vast majority of those 745,000 visas uh, handed out by the government a, a year or so ago were to the dependents of people working here. So we quite happily allow people who are foreign citizens to come here who are, don't earn decent money. And yet we're saying if you fall in love with a Brit, you, you're, that Brit has to earn a certain amount of money, otherwise you can't be together. It doesn't feel right to me. No, and I, and I totally agree with you. It feels like a, a sort of love tax, if you put it that way. If you travelled over to Spain and you met the, uh, the partner of your dreams and you wanted to settle in the United Kingdom, you were both working and you didn't meet that 29 or 34 and a half thousand then pounds Pablo threshold, can't come then here. that really does <laughs> that really does uh, pull the family to pieces. So I do think that perhaps we go for the low hanging fruit, the people that are easier to yeah. charge. And these are remember are people that want to come here legally. Yeah. They are filing all the correct paperwork. They have all their visas in place. 
and more often than not, will have opportunities for employment in the United Kingdom. So I think we should welcome people like that. There have to be stringent categories, I agree. But I think that if we put it up to nearly 40,000, it's going to be out of the reach for the majority of people it, it with pretty normal paying jobs. Yeah, and that, that's and that's the thing, isn't it? And it just, it does, as you say, attack tax on, on love effectively. Um, but we know why this was originally brought in. This was brought in because we had a load of people coming here from for all intents and purposes, third world countries like Pakistan, and then they were basically shipping in wives. That's what was happening on a mass scale. I remember writing about this, the Sunday Express, way back when. And they were basically you know, shipping in wives, uh, barely educated, couldn't speak English, couldn't, couldn't write English, couldn't even write in, 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 in their local language. Um, and, and they're bringing them in, women often they didn't even know from the local village, and, and being, being brought to this country. No one thought that was a good idea. And so they, you know, they bring in some of these rules and that stops that. And then we have, you know, language tests and the things as well. But it seems to me that, you know, this is kind of basically going a bit too far. And, and in, I think there will be numerous individual cases where most right-thinking Brits, taxpaying Brits, would go, that doesn't seem right. I don't see why he or she can't bring the other half in. But, but how, do you, how do you make a policy that doesn't apply to everybody? Well, that's the difficulty. I think the government needs to really understand what it wants its immigration system to look like. And it never really settles on what that is. And all it does is go after those uh, legal minded people who have applied through the correct process. It's not really tackling the matter that most people care about, which is the illegal immigration. Yeah. Legal migration, people are paying huge amounts in visa fees, they are paying huge amounts in the immigration health surcharge so that they can use public services. It costs an awful lot of money. And I think that we will lose some incredibly talented people. I know of uh, Portuguese veterinary surgeons, I know of uh, Polish physiotherapists who wouldn't be able to come here otherwise because of their partner's salary threshold. Yeah. So I think that we are pretty much cutting our nose to spite our face okay. and not actually dealing with the problems which are the main issue within the United Kingdom, which is that of illegal immigration. Yeah. As always, it's look over here, don't look there. Thank you so much, Claire Pearsall. I used to work as a special advisor in uh, the Home Office. Still with me is Philip Ingram, uh, of course, uh, and uh, you're a former military intelligence officer. But, you know, it, this doesn't seem to me to be a law that really tackles the issue, as Claire says, that we really are concerned about. It, it, it doesn't, and looking at the numbers, you know, that excludes you know, young soldiers who um, serve overseas from potentially bringing their wives back in because they're never going to hit mm. that threshold for years until they get promotion up to up to level where they're in there. Yeah. So you, there must be other ways of doing this that are better you know, by you know, stopping access to benefits for uh, a, you know, 10 years after or a yeah. period of time when people come in, insisting that people work whenever they come in so they're contributing to society and contributing... Get a job of whatever insurance. kind. Yeah. Exactly, whatever kind, for, for a period of time, and that qualifies you to, to get in. You know, what if someone earns £29,000 year brings their spouse in and then is made unemployed you know, two years yes. later and and is they have to get sent then, home. exactly there's, there's there's too much confusion also, around these arbitrary Brits, Brits standards. Brits should be allowed to marry and live with the partner yeah. of their choice it seems to me again this again this is that sort of those bad laws that's meant to sort of make it look us look well, all the, tough but actually doesn't really deal with there, the there, there, there is a solution get get all the all the spouses put them on a little rubber boat and, and bring them across the channel <laughs> <Which I was laughs> thinking, yeah only, it's only five grand it's a bargain there we are uh, Philip Ingram, thank you very much now, today we're asking you to, uh, about the NHS hospital waiting list. Uh, in the last hour, they've released the latest figures and they've fallen for a fifth month in a row. Yay for Rishi Sunak. 7.54 million uh, treatments still being waited for by 6.5 million patients. Uh, are you confident that your family can get the health care they need? I want to know from you. Tell us your experience, whether good or bad. You can give us a call 0344 499 You can text on 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Brad says, my friend needed bypasses after having a heart attack two months ago and is still waiting. The other guy I know who needs hip replacement, 2.5 years waiting time, he was told. I mean, ridiculous. Paul says, could it be that those waiting died? Um, this, is a, this is a concern. And Wendy says, many signed off because there's nothing they can do for them. Uh, coming up after the break, the NHS has been ordered to reveal the fate of 9,000 children who underwent trans treatment at the controversial Tavistock Clinic. The Health Secretary, Victoria Atkins, has slammed a culture of secrecy and ideology over evidence and safety. We're going to be talking to one of the people who campaigned against this, campaigned for there to be honesty and openness and for this to stop, Graham Linehan. He's up next. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer. You're with Talk TV.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Now, the NHS has been ordered to reveal the fate of 9,000 children who underwent transgender treatment at the controversial Tavistock Clinic in London. The Health Secretary, Victoria Atkins, has slammed a culture of secrecy and ideology over evidence and safety. This after the landmark cash review yesterday called for an end to rushing children into changing their gender and called for a ban on puberty blockers for under 18s. That's already been brought in in the NHS, but still available in private sector and indeed at NHS Scotland. Well, joining me right now to discuss this all way live from Australia is a man who well I mean extraordinarily lost his career his income many friends and even his marriage over speaking out on this issue I'm delighted to welcome Graham Linehan comedy writer and journalist creator of course of the magnificent father Ted Graham thank you for joining us thank you Julia lovely um, to be here it is extraordinary that um, there have been so many people including, you know, Labour representatives and others, and even, you know, the likes of Stonewall and others who've been pushing this agenda, who are now saying, oh, yes, yes, we completely accept all of the findings in the cast review. Absolutely. Look, this is the stuff that you've been saying. Many other campaigners, like J.K. Rowling, Maya Forstetter, Helen Joyce, and other brave souls, James Dreyfus and others, who've been saying, but when you said it, pointing out a lot of the same facts, you saw, basically, your career ended. No one would commission you. You you lost your income. You 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 the pressure on you from losing friends um, and the and the, well, the hate campaigns on social media. Your marriage ended as well. You kind of lost everything. But by the way, your dignity um, on this. Um, but now apparently you were completely right. Do you feel any sense of vindication? Yeah, but I but I'd never 
I never doubted it. You know, I mean, someone wrote today, uh, over the next few years, a lot of people are going to have to come to terms with the fact that they consider themselves intelligent, well-informed people. And they believed one of the most stupid ideas that's ever been put forward. The idea that people can be born in the wrong body. And there's a group of people called trans people who have existed throughout history. And they've just suddenly made an appearance, coincidentally, after they started uh, coming up with the uh, phrases and uh, arguments um, uh, that they continually deploy on websites like Tumblr and Reddit uh, in the middle of the 20, uh, 2010s, you know, 2010 to 2020. So this is a completely faddish load of nonsense that came from academia in the US, uh, some very perverted ac uh, uh, doctors uh, in Europe, um, in fact, I'm over here on the other side of the world, and one of the one of the worst offenders was a man named John Money, who invented the theory of gender ideology and uh, uh, sexually abused uh, two male twins in his care. He right. Actually okay. I don't have any information on that. So legally speaking, I can't. Oh, he's long dead. He's long. Okay. I'm, I'm thank God, because I'm just thinking the lawyers are going to be in here in about three seconds. Um, okay. But this yeah, is the but thing. I, all, this... I'll say is, all I'll say is people should Google John Money, and okay. they will see where the concept but of gender this identity. This is the thing. There's a lot of you. You you went further than a lot of people who were critical of this, saying that you think there was actually much more sort of sinister. Um, sort of direction behind where this and I have to say looking more and more into this I, I am more and more coming around to your point of view on that uh, but certainly at the, the very bare minimum the stuff that Ka uh, the Hillary Cass exposed shows that you know the, 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 the absolute disregard for the the safety the mental health and the physical health and the long-term impacts for children at the Tavistock clinic and, and by many of those working this book is absolutely outrageous and, and I would say blatantly clearly breach of uh, the Hippocratic Oath and also probably criminal in many cases. Do we need to go further? Because the Hillary Class report points out that actually many of the clinics refuse to actually comply at all. We have no long-term information on the children who were treated even at the Tavistock. They didn't seem to even care. Maybe they didn't want to find out because they knew what they were doing was so wrong. Um, but now we, we actually are getting a full, you know, expose of this. But this could have happened years ago. This could have not been allowed to happen at all. And it was people like you speaking out that have helped push this. Um, do you, I mean, do you feel a sense of anger at the authorities that, including, by the way, this Tory government, that did so little about this for so long? Uh, well, my, my problem is that, like, I've been talking about this for six years and my anger has come and gone. I found after about two, three years, no one was listening to me. Uh, I went on Newsnight, was interviewed by Sarah Smith and was treated as if I had gone insane um, when I was saying exactly the same thing that people are saying now. So my anger is spent. Uh, then again, I haven't really read, I haven't yet had time over here to read the cast report in full. And I can tell you that my gay friends who are reading it are so angry they can barely speak. You know, this is a whole generation of gender non-conforming, often gay children yep. who have been sterilized and maimed for life. I think that Stonewall, Mermaids, Pink News, and a few other institutions should be criminally investigated for conspiracy to commit GBH against children. I that's, have to say, that's I, how I, serious I, 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 I agree with you in terms of how serious it is because it is extraordinary, especially there was some extraordinary conversations that reported uh, uh, that are going on at the Tavistock by whistleblowers that, you know, they were la laughing. <laughs> there won't be any gay children left in the country because so many, particularly young gay women, uh, young gay girls were going to the clinic and, and young boys and basically being told, I mean, again, Stonewall and, May and Mermaids doing this, you know, that, oh, if you're not, you know, if, if you're a tomboy or if you're quite an effeminate uh, boy, well, then you're probably trans. No, you may well be straight, you may well be gay, and there's nothing wrong with either of those things. Be you, live your life, and get on with it. But then suddenly, people, young children were, in, you know, vulnerable children, often they'd been abused, they'd been neglected, they'd had trauma, they had other mental health problems. Um, a huge number of them were autistic as well and had other, uh, you know, learning difficulties and things. And, and and, and then they were put on this railroad track to, as you say, infertility and, and body mutilation. It is the biggest childcare scandal in our lifetime. And suddenly everyone's just turning on a sixpence and saying, 
Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that shouldn't have happened. When two days ago, they were cheering it on and calling people like you bigots. Yeah, they can't face it. They can, it's too big. You know, I mean, when I, I think one of the things that, that has happened over the last few years is I think people said to themselves, if this is true, if this story is true, then everyone, the media, the BBC, oh, uh, the BBC. my celebrity friends, everyone is lying to us. And I think that the magnitude of that lie basically blew people's minds and they couldn't they couldn't look at it they couldn't accept it because they knew that if they if they did if they absorbed what was happening they would come over to my side yeah. lose their livelihoods um lose their friends lose their marriage and they would be uh you know in the same position I'm in which which a lot of people for many years look at as a kind of oh poor Graham he he he, he kind of uh, he went, went, he went a, bit a bit off mad, the rails you know? yeah can I say, yeah. do, you, do you regret yeah. it? Like, I've been lucky enough to be able to speak out. I'm not like my force director, I lost a job or, you know, I've been able in my job uh, to, to, to speak out on this issue um, and, and not lose my livelihood, not lose my marriage and things like that. Do you regret speaking out? Do you, do you think you made a difference that was worth it, that meant those, that loss of the, the, you know, the accolades and the work and the income and, of course, your marriage? Do you think that was worth it? I, I I am astonished that there's anyone in the world who can put their career above the uh, safety of children. You know, yeah. I would never do that. Um, when I turned down two hundred thousand pounds from Hattrick Productions, uh, who told me to take my name off the Father Ted the Father Ted musical, I didn't do it because I did not want to earn money on the kind of uh, maiming and sterilization of children. You know, and Thank I think you. Jimmy Mulville. And many others and my colleagues on that show should be ashamed of themselves, not only for what they did to me, but for what they did to children and for how they let down the women yep. in their lives. Absolutely. They are an absolute disgrace, you know. And I, I, all I can say is, all I can say is, you know, thank God this has happened. Thank God for the cast report. Um, uh, hopefully now these women, these children will be saved from an appalling future of medicalized Harm, you know. Absolutely. Graham, you're an absolute hero um, uh, to so many of us on this side of the debate. Thank you for everything you've done. And my God, we want him back at writing on our TV screens. Graham, no, no, I'll leave you to uh, enjoy it. I think it's a late e evening in Australia. Thank you for joining us, uh, Graham. And a really brief word uh, from my guest in the studio, uh, Philip Ingram. It's extraordinary that people lost careers, lost marriages and things. Over. So many friends, totally, you know, just absolutely out of polite society for speaking up for children's safety. It is. It's shocking. Um, your medical professionals are enabling and have in recent years enabled too many people to go for chemical solutions or surgical solutions to what people think is wrong with them. No, yeah, just, just There's nothing live, wrong live, with live you. Yourself. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Be happy in yourself. Exactly. It's, it's been a terrible, terrible travesty. Well, look, joining me right now to discuss this as well is uh, Zoe Chowney, who's a campaigner for, I'm told, the LGBT plus community. I don't think there is a LGBT plus community, but Zoe, thank you very much for joining us. Um, do you feel ashamed uh, that people like Graham Linehan and people like J.K. Rowling have been called bigots when they've simply said the same thing that the cast review says in black and white? You know what? Firstly, I'm not actually a campaigner for the for the community. Um, That's what I'm a, build, build as to me. Apologies I, for that. I'm, I'm a founder and a, and, a, and a CEO of a fintech company, but I, I also do some speaking on this subject. Mm -hmm. um, what, what I hate is all this polarization, this extremist on both sides. I think there are um, extreme views on the transgender side, which I think don't do anybody any good. What and are the extreme that, that views on the other side? I haven't heard any extreme views on the other side. Extreme views on the other side would be saying that people like me don't exist. And, no, but people and it's, don't it's not... say that. No, no. I don't, if people say, oh, <laughs> no, there's dehumanisation and eradication of trans people. No, simply saying that no one's born in the wrong body. Of course you exist, but, I mean, you, you identify as a woman, but people say, you're a biological man, you're a man. Um, and you can live how you want, dress how you want, live how you can, have a, live your best life. Wonderful, but it doesn't mean that we believe you're actually a woman. That doesn't mean you don't exist. That's not an extremist view. That's and, and just a biological you know, fact. That, and Julia, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that well, at it all. Wasn't I, extremist, I, I was it? You know, you know, I. 
I'm I'm naturally quite a skeptical person. This whole thing with with trans kids, um, I would never think that was a thing. I would always think that, you know, what they're probably just confused or exploring, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <clears throat> but it, it but it happened to me. Um, I remember being very early childhood, being very distressed at the the you know my my sex like being being male and. I used to pray to a god every single night through my my entire childhood that I'd wake up, you know, with a different body, a et cetera, et cetera. Does and that it, mean you should happened. have been given treatment? And were, I mean, did you get treatment no. early on or not? Do you think? But that's the. No. Do you think that children who are feeling unhappy and confused should get irreversible treatment like that? No, no, I don't. What what I think should have what I wanted. You know, I'm, I'm getting I'm getting old now. I was, I was born in the early seventies, and what I wanted. I, I couldn't talk about it. You couldn't talk about these kind of issues, mm. uh, you know, in, in those years. What I wanted was to be told that it's fine. Yeah. We can talk about it. Things be worked out in the fullness of time. You're not a complete weirdo. Well, you might be, but not for this particular reason. <laughs> <laughs> and You might be a little that, bit different, but that's okay. We like people and, who are different. That, in, the fullness, in the fullness of time, things can be worked out. Um, with... What frustrates me is the fact that you know, some trans people and some people that kind of seem to be quite against the trans community seem to be so, so far apart and there's so much aggression between them. And I just think I just, it upsets me. I, I don't, don't I see, I don't accept that. I don't think, I don't think there's been toxic debate on, on my side of the argument. No one's against trans people. JK Rowling's mm. accused of being a bigot. She's never said a single negative word about trans people. Mm. She talked about activists who target her and the, and the threat mm. to women's safety and, 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 and safe places. I mean, the toxicity has been entirely on one side. I, do you know what? I think it's a bit like a bunch of school children, to be honest. I think it's, I think there's, you know, I'm trying to think of examples, but I've, I've read things that have made me feel comfortable from both sides of, of this argument. And it just seems like a bunch of school children in the playground. It's like, yeah. can't we just come together, talk rationally but, like, like we're but, doing? But hold on a minute, if one know. side is trying to stop children being rendered infertile and, and, and having their bodies mutilated, and when we know that they're not born in the wrong body, that, I'm, I'm not sure there's a middle ground on that. I'm so sorry we have to leave it there. Zoe Chani, I really appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much indeed. Um, coming up in the next hour, uh, we're going to talk more about US uh, President Joe Biden's warning to Iran and a think tank that say they've got the solution to Britain's economic crisis when it comes to housing. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... 
sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> a <laughs> yeah. minute, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. We're on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Where have you been for the last hour? Coming up in this hour, though, the US president has warned Iran not to attack Israel and said America's commitment to Israel's security was ironclad amid warnings that an Iranian retaliation to the killing of an Iranian general in Syria could be imminent. Small matter of World War Three breaking out, folks, don't worry. Uh, meanwhile, tougher new rules on spousal visas come into force today. Citizens need to earn at least £29,000 a year to bring their husbands or wives into the UK. That's up from 18500 The Home Secretary says the changes will protect British workers, but some critics argue it will punish families. Is it a tax on love? And how do we solve Britain's housing crisis? Well, a new think tank report claims to have the solutions to that problem and to Britain's stagnant economic growth. I'll be speaking to the author of that report very soon. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Katie Pilby. Thank you, Julia. Very good morning. The man police arrested over the fatal stabbing of a mum in Bradford while she was walking her baby in a pram has been charged with murder. Habiba Masoom was also charged with possession of a knife. He's appearing in court shortly. Our correspondent, Nick Ellaby, is there. The facts of this case that we know so far is that Habiba Masoom, who's 25, known to be a resident of Burnley, will appear at Bradford Magistrates Court behind me later this morning, charged with murder and possession of a bladed article. It follows the killing of Kulsuma Akta, who was 27. A uh, cousin of Miss Akta's has described her as loving, caring, humble, and also having a gift to make people laugh. And her mother, who's living in Bangladesh, is reported to be constantly crying. The US president has vowed support for Israel amid threats by Iran to retaliate for this month's deadly strike on its consulate in Syria. Well, Joe Biden said the US commitment to Israel is ironclad and that it will do all it can to protect Israel's security. It comes as the Israel military says it's killed three of the sons of Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh. All of them worked for the Hamas military. They're among the highest profile targets to be killed in Gaza so far. One person has been killed and five others injured, including two children, after gunmen opened fire in a residential area of Washington, D.C. Investigators believe the suspects left a car and began shooting at people on the street. Police have issued a public alert for the car that fled the scene. We are working v tirelessly to, to really help remove some of these illegal guns that are on our streets. We're working with our ATFs. We're working with some of our task force. Uh, what we're seeing is an increase of guns in the district, and we're doing everything we can to ensure that we're removing those guns off of our streets. Meanwhile, Donald Trump has criticized Arizona's new abortion ban, saying it goes too far. The former president, who was in office when the historic Roe v. Wade legislation was overturned, which means women in the state could be jailed for getting an abortion unless it's to save the mother's life. Trump's criticism comes just days after he released a statement saying abortion rights should be left to the US states. 
Nearly half of NHS staff are looking for a new job outside of the service. Well, figures released today found that 47% of people have spent time looking at job adverts to leave the NHS, while around a third had actively inquired about it. Former NHS Trust Chair Roy Lilly told Talk TV he's not surprised. We're seeing a lot of youngsters now who once went into nursing because they sort of wanted a, a job for life. It was a career. Now they're saying, you know what, I want a job and a life. And a lot of them are leaving the NHS. And a once a day pill to treat migraines has been given the green light on the NHS in England, which could help relieve symptoms in more than 170,000 people. The medication will be an option for frequent sufferers who've tried at least three other treatments without success. But there are calls this morning for the life changing pill to be made more accessible on the NHS as quickly as possible. That is the news for now. Let's get some weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's finally looking warm and bright across much of the UK for this afternoon. Not everywhere, though. Along southern areas of England, mainly around the south coast, it will be murky, cloudy, and there will be some patchy light rain and drizzle. But everywhere else, some good spells of sunshine, largely dry as well, and above average temperatures. We could locally see highs of 19 to 20 degrees Celsius, this most likely around the East Midlands towards East Anglia. But as I said, everywhere seeing above average temperatures. Overnight then, and we start to see rain spreading across Ireland, Northern Ireland, the north and west of England, and Wales and over at Scotland as well. It will turn a bit blustery across these parts, but the winds are coming from a southwesterly direction, a mild airflow, so it remains mild overnight everywhere with temperatures in double figures once again. And then for tomorrow, it's more of a northwest southeast divide, and it's the north and west seeing the unsettled conditions with showery rain at times across Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and parts of northern England at first, particularly to the northwest. But the rest of England and Wales seeing some good spells of sunshine, and there will be mainly dry conditions there. Warm again with the highest temperature of the year so far possible in the southeast at up to 22 degrees Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you are with Talk TV. Joining me right now to run through all the biggest stories of the day is former senior military intelligence officer, still think he needs a short job title, uh, Philip Ingram. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us all this morning. Or, or you will do. Yeah, that bloke, <laughs> that bloke, he's here again. That one who knows stuff. Yes, look, there's lots to talk about. Um, I do just want to get your reaction though. Again, like we spoke to... Um, uh, Graham Linehan, um, who was just an absolute hero for so many, along yeah. with the J.K. Rowling, the Maya Forster, the people who like you put their reputations, their you know their, their work, their, their everything on the line uh, to stand up for women's rights, to stand up for children's safety uh, when it came to trans ideology and activism. Um, this cash report yesterday um, uh, published uh, uh, 400 plus pages, sorry, 800, 800 pages, but it's like you know four four year report, um, and and the repercussions of that of so many of the people who, and the organisations that have basically been calling people like Graham Linehan and me and J.K. Rowling and everyone else bigots for saying, oh, we don't think this is a good idea. There's no such thing as a trans child. You know, you shouldn't be doing this. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely fine. All chiming in, including Wes Streeting, the Shadow mm -hmm. Health Secretary, although he at least admitted, yes, he was wrong. Um, uh, and it looks like we pretty much all the recommendations about what should happen in terms of the therapy and the treatment mm -hmm. for children will, will happen. But also... Um, the, the, the fact that like Stonewall and Mermaids and organisations pushing this agenda, sending out you know, advice on how to bind your breast to 13-year-old you know, girls and things like that. I mean, you know, even they are having to accept some of this. Do you think this is the beginning of the end of this mad, terrible, horrible, tragic craze? Uh, or is this just people in these organisations realising basically how dangerous it is to be on the wrong side of things anymore? Well, I hope it's the beginning of the end. You know, we need to get people who are heading the majority organisations out there to get a bit of backbone back and stop allowing the polarisation by minority activists to actually take control and of the, the whole narrative. stop giving them taxpayers' money as exactly. well to do that. Exactly. And, That's and the bit need... that blows my mind. Stonewall and Mermaids being paid money by our, our, with our taxes. And, and we're enabling them to try and impose their views on the majority of the people. No, the people representing the majority need to sit there and go, hey, 
I can hear you. You've got a free voice to speak, but we're not listening because it doesn't apply to most people. Yeah. We're not going to discriminate, but... There's Go no away. hate, there's no yeah. phobia. Exactly. No. Do you know, I had a conversation um, at, a, at an event with the uh, Victoria Atkins, the, uh, uh, the health secretary uh, recently, and she was talking to me about, you know, all the amazing work they were doing on tackling this, you know, the, the, the trans issues and things. And I just said, but it's not good enough. I said, look, you know as well as I do, you're going to be out of office come the autumn, and then Labour are going to come in, and they're as mad as the SNP on a lot of this stuff. And I said, this isn't just about women's safety. We can, you know, women can fight and stand up for ourselves. But what's happening in the NHS, you know, you're actually in charge of mm -hmm. that you're putting my taxpayers money and other people's money into that and you're allowing this stuff to happen on your watch and it pretty much pretty much exploded and started on your watch as a Tories and it's going to carry on under your watch and it's going to get even worse under Labour unless you put a stop to it. I said, you're going to come out of office. You need to make sure that the laws are all changed and that everything you need to get the trans nonsense out of schools, out of the NHS, out of government before you leave office mm -hmm. because otherwise you're looking at, I said, this is about child safety. I like to think that I might have had a bit of influence here. <laughs> poor lady was just trying to have a drink. I was ranting at her for about 10 minutes. I'm just the same off fair as on air, everybody. But, you know, as you, you can't pat yourself on the back if there are children still being given puberty blockers who, who, who are autistic or maybe gay. Well, exactly. And, you know, the, the ministerial response should have been, that's unacceptable, we're, we're binning it. And that's, that's the end. Not just binning that's... it. Not guidance. I don't want guidance no, no, no. in There's schools a, and hospitals. Speak. You'll get that back You phone can't in. do this yeah. because it's wrong. Yeah. And we won't let you do it and we will punish you we will sack you and frankly criminalize you if you yeah. do do it and, and these minority groups you know the, the, what they're putting out should never get to ministerial level because they've got bigger things yeah. to concentrate on i would really like governments to stop giving any of our money to all these campaigning groups any of them any or all of them unless you're a charity you're actually literally physically helping homeless people into a shelter unless you are actually giving any absolute practical help i don't want you to be getting our money if you've got a cause that a lot of people will back People will give you money, like well, the exactly. RSPCA or whatever. Um, can I just bring you some breaking news there in the last uh, uh, few minutes, uh, actually, since the news? Um, we've obviously saw that at uh, Bradford Magistrates Court, we had uh, Habiba uh, Masum, um, uh, who has been uh, charged with murdering Kasima Akhtar, uh, who's the woman who was stabbed to death in the uh, middle of a uh, uh, at Bradford City Centre uh, when she was just walking her baby in a pram mid-afternoon on a Saturday. Habiba Masoom has now been remanded in custody uh, after being charged with that murder. He was in the glass-fronted uh, dock and he was told he would appear again at Bradford Crown Court on Friday. Uh, he spoke only to confirm his name, date of birth and address during the six-minute long hearing. Obviously, that is sub judice that case, so obviously we can't discuss any more of that. What we can discuss, though, is um, the imminent prospect of World War three, which we seem to have a, a sort of on the cards on a regular basis, Philip Ingram. Now, um, this is in the wake of, um, a, on the 1st of April, um, that, that Monday uh, uh, over a week ago, uh, the Israeli forces, the IDF, uh, basically uh, sent an airstrike into Syria that killed a number of senior Iranian generals. Uh, in particularly, the most high profile was Mohammed Reza Zaidi, who led the elite Quds force of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard in Lebanon and Syria until 2016. Now, as a result of this, they would have expected some retaliation mm -hmm. of some sort. But Joe Biden last night warned Iran not to attack uh, Israel amid reports of an imminent missile strike. And he made it very clear that his commitment to Israel's security, regardless of all the, the difficult conversations with Benjamin Netanyahu over uh, what's happening in Gaza with Hamas at the moment, was ironclad and that mm. Washington would do all we can to protect Israel from an attack by Tehran. What do you read into all of this? Well, it's, it's that and there's other stuff. Russia has just advised Russian citizens not to travel to the Middle East at all. And Lufthansa has just suspended all flights into Tehran. So there's wider intelligence out there uh, turning around saying that Iran is going to respond in some way. Whether that's a direct attack against Israel from uh, using Iranian military, that's the least likely, but they could do it. Um, more likely would be to use Iranian proxies, so Lebanese Hezbollah and rocket attacks from I mean, the south of Lebanon I mean, the, or other groups. I mean, the Iranians basically fund all the... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. or groups and, across the and, and, that's what, and that's what this um, IRGC commander was there doing. He was coordinating all of that. He was enabling it. He was getting the arms to it and all the rest of it. So he was a direct threat yeah. to um, the, well, the, the safety and security um, of Israel. And again, I have to say, I, mean, I, I, feel this, I feel this exactly in the same way as I, I feel about the, uh, uh, the Hamas leaders uh, mm -hmm. whose sons and um, grandchildren were also killed in, in a an on IDF attack, and he appeared to be remarkably unemotional about it. I mean, he, of course, is hiding out in Qatar. Um, 
uh, but his uh, his children and his uh, grandchildren uh, killed in uh, in an attack. It looks like a target attack by the IDF in Gaza. I have to say, as much as I don't want children ever, uh, you know, they're not. They should never be held account for what their parents or grandparents do. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's like, hey, here's an idea. Don't start a war when you've yeah. got children and grandchildren who are in the way when you're happily sitting in your millionaire but, mansion in Qatar. But again, we, we say children and grandchildren. You know, the Israeli children, say, ad they're, they're, adults. They're, they're adults, and the Israeli say they, these, these Hamas. were Hamas commanders exactly. that, that were there. And, and Very we, glad. I'm, we don't, I'm glad that. We don't know the age of their, uh, the grandchildren, but the grandchildren could be Hamas fighters, so legitimate target. And this is where you, the language that we use in describing a lot of these people actually feeds into those activists who are trying to undermine yeah. where we are in democracy. Yeah, abs no, you know, absolutely. Israel if they were said, young children, they'd you know, got nothing to do with know, this. Hamas, I, I Hamas commanders who just happen to be related to the Hamas leader. Yeah, um, but in, in terms of, like, you know, if you, if, you know, when Israel launched this attack in Syria, they knew there would be retaliation yeah. of some sort, even though there's yeah. no doubt at all there's been massive, <laughs> for Iran, are sense of restraint on their side. We have seen rockets from Hezbollah in, uh, in, in Lebanon raining into uh, northern uh, um, uh, Israel. Um, and, I mean, huge number of Israeli citizens having to be evacuated, currently being mm -hmm. put up in hotels uh, further south for their own safety. That has not stopped. All the attention has been on, on, on Gaza and Hamas and the Palestinian people there. Um, but in terms of retaliation that would go further, that would see the breakout of a war, the Iranians know that if the if they properly attack Israel, realistically, the, the it, US have to act. And they know that the US might is so great that that is going to end very badly. They, they also know the Israelis will react. The, the, the Israelis are fighting a war on four fronts, Every front, really. Yeah. Um, you know, war with Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Um, an internal security situation on the West Bank, much of their own causing, yeah. um, with, with the extreme right wing um, extremists the that are in there yeah. in, the, in, the, in the settlements. Um, the southern, their, their northern border, southern border of Lebanon with Lebanese Hezbollah, and with what Iran is doing from elsewhere and stirring things up. If Iran attacks Israel directly, Israel has got the ability to attack Iran back directly and, and hurt them. So they won't want to do that. And they've cared not a jot about uh, uh, sending out their forces to sort of take out, you know, uh, this, you know attempts to build, you know, nuclear weapons yep. in Iran. And of course, America and Britain all say, oh, oh, that's terrible, in a sort of, thank you very much for doing that yes. sort of way. Here's, Israel here's does our dirty work. Yes, yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, a, a question, you know, are we... Are we about to enter World War Three? Is this slowly creeping? We've had all these concerns about Ukraine and Russia. Uh, Are we slowly creeping towards a mass sort of conflagration in the Middle East that will drag in Britain well, and other allies? You know, I've been involved from you know, the, the day I joined the army uh, and now commentating on, on global geopolitics and all the rest of it. I've been involved in this for over 40 years. I've never seen a clear path to war until this year. And I see several paths. Now, that, doesn't mean Happy gonna, Thursday, that, everybody. That, that doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> There's a lot of things that have to go through. But with what's happening in uh, Europe with Russia and Ukraine, with, uh, with Russia's links into Iran, with what's happening in the Middle East, stirred by Iran, and with Chinese influence going on in the background, what's happening in the South, Southeast Asia, Asia in the South uh, China Seas, etc., is extremely worrying. And this is why we need to be preparing and getting our militaries prepared, because it's going to take years to get them properly prepared to deal with this. If, yeah. And we're not doing that. And we're not going it was to get interesting, years actually, notice. overnight, um, Boris Johnson has been in Canada and is speaking out lots of criticism of Rishi Snap. One of them was about we're not spending enough on defence. Like, <laughs> Boris Johnson, were you actually ever Prime Minister? Are you aware that you actually had powers? And I realise we were dealing with Brexit. I realise we were dealing with Covid. But, you know, you were actually in office. You could have done something about this. We've known for years. I, I don't know how many more former defence secretaries <laughs> and, yes. and former hugely senior figures in the military have yep. to speak out and say, guys, we really need to spend more on defence well, before we actually do. Yeah, the, the thing that gets me is a lot of these former defence secretaries and former senior military personnel are criticising decisions that they personally made on no, their, no, on no, their no, watch. No, 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 they don't get to decide. Look, we know that a lot goes on privately and they can't, they're they not allowed to publicly criticise the government because they're going to be you know, above the political but there's a really but easy way that they, there's a really easy way that senior military officers can do it if they believe what's happening is wrong. They resign because that sends a very clear political statement. It's not going to affect their pension. It's not going to affect anything else. It'll probably You're mean that they You're saying they should can... leave office and make the statement, this is why I'm resigning. I am resigning because no, uh, you know, I, can, I, I cannot head, head a force that hasn't got the resources to do it. Yeah. That would send such a clear political statement. None of them have done it. Yeah. None of them have stood on morals and, and, and done anything. The only, the only person that's done that in recent times is um, the RAF 
group captain uh, Lizzie Nicholl, who resigned over being or given an illegal order to um, uh, to, to have women and ethnic minorities have, have women ethnic minorities over over a priority of of, of 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 whoever had scored best on the on their yeah. recruit applications in the RAF. That, that is a very interesting point. Yeah, that again, you think near the end of your career, you could you could risk doing that, and it doesn't affect um, their pension. You, they will still go out with a very very yeah. large pension. Can I ask also just finally about Ukraine because uh, President Zelensky is uh, in a situation where he is now lowering the age of conscription. Yeah. I think from 27 to 25, they're looking at bringing in more women. We've seen you know lots of Ukrainian men now trying to leave the country. Country, uh, don't want to fight on the front line. And in fact, actually, in terms of, you know, losses, I mean, Russian losses are off the scale. They are yeah. 10 times bigger or something than Ukrainians. But we know this is a very nasty, dirty war. This mm -hmm. is World War One trenches type of warfare. Um, and who would want to go to war? Mm -hmm. But um, what do you make of people, you know, leaving their country rather than fighting for their country in this circumstance? Well, when it comes to you know, the matter of national survival, which is the game that they're in, um, and having to look after your neighbours and your family and all the rest of it. And knowing then, what Russia does when they do take power. Uh, uh, exactly. Then you know, it, it's morally wrong that people are trying to leave. I can understand why people get scared, because war is horrible. Yeah. Absolutely horrible. And the Ukrainians are losing a lot of people on the front line as well. Russia is losing between um, 750 and 1,200 a day. Yeah. You know, the, the, the casualties are, are massive. It's you can't... You can't um, Donald Trump has made comments about how, you know, he expects, you know, that Zelensky and Russia and, and, uh, and Vladimir Putin, they really want an excuse for the war to end and you just have to give it to them. Basically, Zelensky will have to cede a bunch of territory to Russia. Do you think that is how the war will end? Well, the war will end through diplomacy and through negotiations at, at some stage. But if it gets to that point, that will then regenerate a Cold War and therefore a requirement for massive military across from the north, the north of Norway, the whole down, the whole way down to the south, the south of Turkey. It will stimulate the likes of China to turn around and say, "Oh, well, if we go and take Taiwan by force and then just play it out for a few years, um, then uh, we will, we will, there will be no consequences for us, and it'll cause other nations around the world to have the same sorts of view." So it would be. A, it's a very, very, very dangerous position and could lead us closer to World War III faster. Yeah, but that's a concern. <laughs> what a cheery chat, everybody. What a cheery chat. <laughs> um, just finally, I want to ask about China and these counterfeit stamps. Yes. A lot of people are being told that you have to pay £5 to come and collect your, your letter from the post office because it's a counterfeit uh, stamp. People have bought them totally legitimately. Yeah. Apparently, they're flooding the market. And apparently, China is behind it. Uh, but there, it's impossible to tell the difference between the two of them, uh, apart from you have special scanning uh, machinery. Um, why on earth would China be doing this? How, is the, how does this disrupt us? Well, it's a, it's a, no one buys stamps anyway. No one could afford them. <laughs> it's, a, it's a standard tactic of war. You know, during the Second World War, um, counterfeit banknotes, both sides were producing counterfeit banknotes to try and impact the economies of you know, the, the, the German Reich or impact the British economy and all this because the Germans were counterfeiting um, you know, sterling uh, and all this. To, to cause inflation. And, and therefore, and their, yeah, to cause inflation and everything else. So what this could be... It's either Chinese criminal organisations trying to make lots of money out of it, or what it could be is the Chinese government um, looking at just testing their processes and their procedures to see what impact it has and just, just have a little look, do something, see what, see what it is, I, and then I, I put it back in the shelf I, again. I can't think that we need China's help at all to, to, to ruin our postal service Oh, uh, oh they're, very, they're very good at helping. They, we, they'd love to help. We, we do, we, we're good at that. <laughs> There's one thing Britain can do, it's ruin our own postal service without any help from the Chinese. And we're going to be talking about that, actually, the post office inquiry ongoing, uh, of course, and we've got the uh, former managing director who's giving evidence. We're going to talk to Lord Arbuthnot a little bit later oh. in the show. Uh, he, of course, is the former MP, Yes. Uh, who was basically one of the real heroes of your story in that Mr Bates versus the post office story. Um, let's get back to another topic, though. Uh, let's talk about um, the NHS, because just before we went on air, we've got the latest NHS hospital waiting list figures, uh, and they have fallen for a fifth month. Oh, yay, it's cocktail time at the Department for Health and in number 10. Uh, 7.54 million treatments being waited for by some 6.5 million patients. But I want to know from you, are you confident that your family can get the health care they need? What has been your experience in recent months or years? Do give us a call on 0344 499 text on 87222, or you can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Ian has done just that and says, awesome, just the 7.54 million, more than 10% of the population. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. We shouldn't be cheering this on, should we? Roscoe says, yes, as I don't live in the South, the North East hasn't they got the same problems the South faces. That is interesting. You know, there's a postcode lottery. And Leo says, possibly manipulated figures because there is a general election on the horizon. Do we seriously think people are going to go, well, I wasn't going to vote Tory because of that 7.5 million 
or 7.7, I think it went up to. But if it gets down to 7.4, brilliant. I, I'm not quite sure that's going to fly. See, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see a comparison between all elements of the UK, you know, w whether waiting lists are dropping in Scotland, because all, the, all these figures are NHS England. England. I should, yeah, you're so, quite right. So Wales and Northern Ireland are I think I believe they are worse on virtually all of those metrics. Uh, I, but it is extraordinary. You've got things like, I mean, this is what amazing. People waiting days, weeks even to get a, a, a GP appointment. People waiting many, many hours in A&E. But extraordinarily, even for things that, you know, the stuff that really matters. If you've got possible cancer, getting, getting into see a GP, getting that referral, but even once you've got that referral, you've seen a consultant and you're referred for treatment, one third, one third of people who are referred for cancer treatment wait more than two months. The idea that that is acceptable mm. in a first world country is is laughable to me. I mean, if it wasn't so serious, it would be laughable. It's extraordinary. But anyway, you've been getting in touch on the phones about your experiences. 0344 499 I say is the number to call. Stuart has called that number and he's in London. Hello, Stuart. Oh, good morning, good morning how are Dad. you? Very well indeed, thanks for joining us. What's been your experience? Do you trust well, that your family can get help? <laughs> no. Well, I was, had to have a procedure a few months ago. So I went in there, and this lady come in while I was waiting in the outer room, asked me 20 minutes of questions. They made uh, about as much uh, relevance to my procedure as what you as your furniture in your home. Yeah. Then after, after all that, I've gone in, and she, another one asked me the same questions all over again. The consultant apologised to me. He said, I have apologised. These questions have nothing whatsoever to do with the procedure you're having today. This is his exact words. He said, imagine this multiplied by millions oh. of times throughout the NHS. Yeah. It's, what it is, it's these pen pushers they've got there. That are, that are not medical people making up this nonsense to justify their non-job. Absolutely, getting their little clipboards out. I mean, absolutely. Right. We know that a lot of the biggest problems are bureaucracy. I know a relative of mine who went in for a cataract operation, and then the second one three weeks later, exactly the same issue. They're called in at nine o'clock, six people at the same time, and then only half the operations were able to go ahead because their paperwork hadn't arrived from the other hospital or from their GP. And and when he went because this relative is very similar to me on this, when they went to actually talk to the uh, senior figures in the hospital, to go, clearly you've got a problem with your admin because, uh, you know, we've got operating theatres and top consultants unable to work on people and people waiting a long time for an operation that never happens because of paperwork missing. And they said, oh, yeah, it, it happens. This is the norm. This happens every day. And, you think, every, sort it every, out. Every time I go to, go to the hospital, they're asking me, the same questions. I said, you've got all this on the what? computer. Surely you're logged into my GP. Yeah. You must every single time. The Stop same the answer, same questions. It is absolutely ridiculous. What, what sort you know, of the... questions that were completely irrelevant to the operation? <laughs> yeah, sure. There was... I can't there was so many. It was just... were it's so long ago. Are you, com but... are you confident that if you say you needed an emergency operation, I mean, I, th I think the NHS could be quite good in emergencies, although we know 250 people die every week now, according to the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, because they're not being seen quick enough in A&E. But we say, well, A&E was good. But are you confident that, you know, if, if it's something serious like cancer, like heart disease, that, that you or your family would get treated in a timely fashion? Well, let me tell you another A few years ago, I had a blockage in the stomach. I knew it was a blockage because yeah. of the stomach operation I've had because the pain comes in waves. Yeah. I've gotten in... It was Edgeway General was still open then before they closed it down. And I said to them, I have got a blockage in the stomach. I know what it is. Yeah. No, you haven't. And luckily enough, Mr Harrison, the consultant, was there. Otherwise, I'd have died. He tested wow. me, got straight down to the operating theatre. So and they've got people in there haven't got a clue. And yeah. So it's just, luck, it's just luck who you see in which hospital you're in. That exactly. is the worry, isn't it? Um, really appreciate your call, Stuart. I hope you're, you're well and uh, stay well and your family too. Thank you for getting in touch. Um, Philip Ingram, I mean, this is the concern, isn't it? This postcode lottery that sort of you go to one hospital, not to another hospital. And I'm being advised when I had my daughter mm. 17 and a half years ago, you know, by the health secretary, which hospital to go where we had a better chance of coming out alive. Yeah. And, and, and this is where I don't think the political approach where one party is fighting another 
another party to score political points yeah. addresses the real issue that is with administration, with management. It's not and, about and, money and, and, anymore. And, and put, put the resources in to, needed to make the NHS management more efficient and stop trying to score political points off it. Absolutely, Philip Goodman. Thank you very much indeed. Coming up after the break, we're going to talk about something completely different. Joe Biden has warned Iran not to attack Israel and said America's commitment to Israel's security is ironclad. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brew, and you're with Talk TV. Now, the US president has warned Iran not to attack Israel and said that America's commitment to Israel's security was ironclad. This amid warnings that an Iranian retaliation to the killing of an Iranian general in Syria could be imminent. Well, joining me now to discuss this and a few other stories as well is a foreign affairs columnist at The Independent, Mary Dijewski. Uh, good morning to you, Mary. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, uh, just in terms of, of this threat, look, we know once there was this attack killing... The no dangerous, um, but it's also, it has to be a very, very fine judgment for Iran because obviously they want to retaliate. <clears throat> they regard the attack on um, part of their mission in Damascus as an attack on their own territory, which of course technically um, as diplomatic mission, that is true. Um, but also they have to be very careful. And I think, you know, it's interesting that the the terms that um, President Biden was talking in, he was obviously directing his, um, his assurances in two directions. He was addressing it to Iran, basically as a threat to Iran of the 
that um, the US would be absolutely be behind Israel. But also, I think it was intended as a sort of counterweight to Israel, because the messages from Biden to um, Netanyahu in the last couple of weeks have been very much that it should um, scale back its operations in Gaza and that it should provide much more um, access for humanitarian aid. So I think um, Biden was really trying to appear, um, as it were, not too aggressive towards Israel, lest that be interpreted by Iran as giving yeah. it, in a way, a sort of free pass. And that, that has been the concern, hasn't it? That any sign yeah. of uh, the West, sort of, and particularly the US as a major backer and a funder of, and indeed a supplier of arms, that, that any scaling back of that support sort of opens the way, like, oh, there might be a free-for-all in Israel. And we know that, you know, a Hamas attack from Gaza is very different from an Iranian attack, and even, indeed, what we've been seeing from Hezbollah uh, in the north, uh, from Lebanon, where we've seen rockets raining down. We've pretty much seen no coverage of that. We've all been focused on what's going on in Gaza. But, you know, it's been it's been kept at sort of a... a, a, a I should be... You know, an acceptable level for sort of the, world, the world's uh, leaders, hasn't it? Just sort of a, a level of retaliation that's deemed acceptable to keep this down. Do you think it's clear that Iran... Well, we certainly know Israel doesn't. We certainly know the West doesn't. Do you think Iran also doesn't want to get into a full-scale war? I think absolutely Iran doesn't want to get into a full-scale war. I mean, one of the most interesting responses immediately after the Hamas attacks of 7th of October was a quite a public statement from the supreme leader of Iran, you know, not, not any sort of junior official, to say exactly that, um, that they didn't want um, to escalate the situation. And so far as I can observe, um, whether you're looking at Hezbollah in, in southern Lebanon or or um, any activities of Iranian proxies in, um, in Syria, they have pretty much been true to their word. So I think they are absolutely as apprehensive um, about the possibilities of, you know, if you like, unleashing World War III or some sort of regional conflagration. I find that quite They're encouraging. <laughs> I do find that quite encouraging, Mary. Thank you on that front. Uh, let me also talk to you about uh, things closer to home and uh, particularly uh, Julian Assange, uh, because uh, Joe Biden yesterday said that he was considering a request uh, uh, was actually uh, comes uh, from the Australian uh, Premier Albanese to drop the prosecution of Julian Assange after judges ruled that the WikiLeaks founder could have grounds to appeal his extradition to the United States. Now, he's been charged with multiple counts of espionage back in uh, 20... Well, he was charged in 2019, relating, of course, to uh, events that are far, far, far long before then. He's been imprisoned in uh, Belmarsh here. It's actually going to be five years uh, as of today, as this extradition battle plays out. And that imprisonment in Belmarsh follows seven years in the Ecuadorian embassy, where he had out over the prospect of being uh, extradited to Sweden on charges of a rape that were later dropped. Now, um, the defence of Julian Assange has always been that he was a publisher, that he's a journalist. He was exposing what we knew, you know, were official documents that exposed illegal activity, criminal activity by the American government and, and other governments, and that he should have the protection, not just of the First Amendment in America, but the protection the journalists should have across the free world. Um, what do you make of Joe Biden saying he is considering this request? Um, does that suggest to you that this is a real possibility and they just want this to kind of go away now? Well, it was quite as I have to say, I found that completely astonishing because if you were going to expect any sort of um, breakthrough on the case of Julian Assange, the last place personally that I would ex expect it to come from was the White House. Yeah. Um, but there we had President Biden saying that he was considering exactly that. Um, and in a way, you could see that it makes sense of a kind, although you also have to be a bit careful about things that um, President Biden says, because it looked quite a sort of um, a spontaneous response. Yes. And it hasn't been completely clear, say, whether he completely understood the question. Now, now this is the trouble, isn't it? Because he makes off the cuff remarks and often his White House staff then have to say, oh, no, that isn't actually the position. But, I mean, again, even if this does bring, bring hope to the Assange case, do, I mean, do you think that he should be extradited to stand, charge, stand, stand on charges in America? 
I mean, personally, I don't think he should be ex extradited because I think the Americans are actually um, trying to use charges to the effect that um, material he published endangered Americans and people working for America. That is hugely contentious because um, his defense is that um, if there was, that he, he Assange personally, um, edited the material very carefully um, with advice to protect um, individuals and that if there were any mistakes on this score then it wasn't down to Julian Assange. Um, I think there, you know, the way that the Assange case is, is, is depicted varies so much, you know, that there is, as it were, the journalistic constituency, but not the complete journalistic constituency, mm. which says that um, extraditing Assange to America would endanger journalists everywhere. Yeah. And then there is the view that um, there are that there are limits to, to 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 journalism, and that what Assange was doing was was not that. Mm. Um, the the latest hearing um, in the British courts was about um, whether the wh whether Assange could appeal against the American extradition request. And the, the, the judges asked for assurances. It was, it's been very, very strange because they said they were reserving their judgment. And then they produced a judgment, which wasn't really a judgment, and asked all the same questions that they'd, that they'd asked for answers for in open court. And those were, we want undertakings from the United States that Assange will not face the death penalty, yeah. that he won't face extra charges, and we want clarity as to whether, as a foreign national, he will enjoy the protection of the First Amendment of the American Constitution on freedom of speech. Um, all of those being quite um, quite important and significant. Mm. Um, and it is possible um, that if what Biden says, said was correct and is an indication of the way the wind is blowing, that some sort of um, compromise is being worked out sort between the American and yeah. the Australians, yeah. given that, Aust that, 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 that Assange is an Australian citizen. It's going to be fascinating to watch how this plays out. Thank you so much for joining us, Mary Dzerzhevsky. There, um, still with me is Philip Ingram. Now you were shaking your head during some of this. Mm. It's, it's a bit of. I don't think Julian Assange is a particularly likable character. Mm. I think we can agree that, and I think we should never let that cloud our judgment on this. I think. Uh, I think there was a certain recklessness, and certainly lots of people who work with him, the Guardian, Washington Post, and they will say they were very unhappy about some of the things that he did and the way he worked, and his, they believe he was reckless and, and putting people's lives at risk. But it seems to me that I don't understand why an Australian Australian citizen operating not in America should have any duty of care to American military operatives and it can be accused of espionage. He wasn't on American soil. He was simply exposing wrongdoing. It was wrongdoing by the American government. I, I understand why the people he got the information from are, are being prosecuted because they committed treason and they signed the Official Secrets Act in America. But but he hadn't, and I don't really understand what he's being prosecuted for. He exposed the wrongdoing in some of what he published. He then published a huge amount of material that was sensitive, and you know, we heard described that he edited it. I saw a lot of that, I've read a lot of it, and I went, oh, that's easy to identify. The technical means by the way that yep. was um, transmitted and, and therefore intercepted. Um, that, that particular phrase will have come from an individual, and you could probably identify who it was by the way it was written. Um, that conversation will have only happened between these two people, so you'll be able to identify who the agent... And you're saying uh, that people who wish those people wrong, I mean, that they, those and, and people could have had their lives at well, risk. Well, those, those, those people will have had their lives at yeah. risk, and people you know, have been killed or imprisoned in their different countries over this. Yeah. And this is where the lack Did of duty have, of care... Okay. That, 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 is that then, is that a moral argument? And you can say, well, you're a bad person. But did he have, did he, he didn't go and kill those people himself. Did he have a duty of care to those people? As, as, as a journalist, and we know how much our editors you know, make sure that we apply the rules and have a duty of care of everything that we put out to make sure that it's fair and it's balanced and all the rest of it, he didn't do that. Full yeah. stop. Underline. So he didn't. He didn't actually apply the journalistic no. rules, and yet no. it was. And yet it was right for us to know. That some of the stuff. Had, some of the stuff was right for us to know. He basically put out 
a huge put, amount of it, which put, other journalists everything. didn't want him put, to put he, out. He put out everything. If he just concentrated on the bits that were right and proper that they came out because they held the Americans and others to account, fantastic. Should he but face? If, should, he, should he face uh, spending the rest of his life behind bars because of what well, he did? You know, the, he, I think what he should face is a judicial process that will then put to Do you bed. Trust America? I don't trust American judicial processes. Well, yeah, the, and I really don't. I don't think they have a proper justice system. They don't the, have a. The justice system is too politicised. Um, and, and there are there are problems with that, but then that's a completely different debate. You should we then let anyone be extradited to the United States for anything well, at any stage? Well, kind of, yeah, because they don't really extradite people to our country, which I think. Well, yes, I, mean, I mean, I was against the you know, European arrest warrant uh, as well for that very same reason. Um, very interesting. Um, we'll see what happens. Uh, obviously, if there are any developments on that front, we'll bring them to you here at Talk TV. Thank you, Philip Ingram. Uh, let's get back to the question I'm asking you this morning though, about NHS uh, hospital waiting list. They have fallen for a fifth month in a row. Yay! Seven point five. 4 million treatments are, are still being waited for by 6.5 million patients. Uh, are you confident, I want to know, is that your family, that you yourself can get the healthcare that you need? Tell us your personal experiences, whether they've been good, whether they have been bad. Give us a call on 0344 499 text on 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Theo has done just that and says, I must say, I've had nothing but outstanding service recently. Indeed, there are many good uh, news stories. Uh, Simon says, I've been waiting for 12 months for an operation on my eye. I've had to wait that long. I'm now partially blind and it won't come back. That shouldn't be happening in a first world country. Uh, and Steph says, until our population is sorted to a manageable level, nothing will work in this country. I, I don't know. You, I mean, you basically can say the NHS just kill us all off and then there'll be fewer people. I don't know. Um, you've also been getting in touch on the phones. Keep those calls coming in. Let's go to Tony. He's in Northamptonshire. Hello, Tony. Good morning, Julia. Good morning. What do you want to say? Fantastic programme. Oh, I was close to tears with your uh, coverage of the trans people and particularly the interview with Graham. Oh, what a but, hero. Lovely man. Yeah, absolutely. Going back to hospital treatment, my, I've had mixed experience. In 2018, I went to see my doctor with blood in the urine and within 11 days, I had cancer removed from my bladder. Yeah. My son, on the other hand, who's only 36, three months ago, uh, he had chronic pain in his stomach, went to hospital, they did MRI scans, and he found he had seven gallbladder stones. They put him on the waiting list and sent him home and told him to uh, take paracetamol. Mm -hmm. uh, after a week of chronic pain, uh, he was taken into hospital, vomiting and with severe pain, mm -hmm. taken by ambulance to the A&E. Uh, they admitted him to hospital but because there wasn't a consultant available, they couldn't operate to remove his gallbladder till Thursday. He was in hospital for a week on uh, morphine yeah. because of his pain, and they even put him in a private ward so he wouldn't upset other patients when he was yelling out in pain. Yeah. Uh, he's a radiographer at the hospital, and he was off work for two months. Oh, so it would have been in there Is he OK now? To get him operation on. He's OK, He's now. okay now. Yes. But again, the way is... but again, it's the idea, oh, we just don't have anyone to operate. Why, why not? I mean, we employ like 1.2 million or something people. Isn't anyone available to operate on this man in agony? No, nobody. Every but... day I was going to hospital and they were, I said, as a consultant, uh, being to see you, as a surgeon, being to see you, uh, no, he's not available, not available. Yeah. So he, would, he had to wait from Saturday until Thursday before he could have uh, his bladder yeah. in his... Gallbladder. gallbladder removed. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it amazing? There's such different experiences. Isn't this the thing? It's kind of the postcode lottery, and it's kind of, are you lucky? Absolutely. Are you lucky? Is but, it, is it, if, have you, do you happen to have the disease that they're treating well that week in that particular hospital? Well, if, if you listen to Richard uh, Tice from uh, Reform, his answer is simple. He can get rid of all the waiting lists in two years. Let's well, pay the doctors more money um, by yeah. reducing their income tax. Let's promote... Uh, uh, hospital insurance and yeah. let more of all do away with this uh, carbon emission policy. All, the, all that nonsense. Yes, get back to the basics. Yeah, well, we shall see. Yeah, it will save £32 billion, pounds, which we can spend yeah. on the NHS. He okay. can eliminate the hospital waiting list I, in two I, years. I love that Richard Tice would have tried to come up with this idea. I don't know whether anyone is going to be eliminating those hospital waiting lists in two years, sadly. Tony, I have to leave that there. Thank you very, very much indeed, though, for your call. I'm glad you all made it through. Um, coming up after the break, um, I'm going to be speaking to a man who reckons he's got the solution to Britain's housing crisis. 
crisis. We'll talk about that up next. I'm talk. Uh, I'm not. I'm not talk TV. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and this is talk. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to <laughs> yeah. for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're yeah, supposed to have was moved another on from that. era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Now, how do we solve Britain's housing crisis? It's something that doesn't seem to come up with politicians very often. It's not even among the five pledges of either Rishi Sunak or Keir Starmer on how they want to be judged and what they want to do for the country, even though it's probably one of the single biggest issues affecting our economy and our livelihoods. Well, a new think tank report from the Institute of Economic Affairs uh, claims to have the solutions to that problem. Oh, yes, and the small matter of tackling Britain's stagnant economic growth as well. We've got four minutes. Let's get to the bottom of it. Let's talk to editorial director at the IEA, author of the report, Dr Christian Nemitz. Uh, good morning to you, Christian. Good morning. I fear, alas, as I often do in this case, haven't left enough time to do this, but you just go for it. How do we tackle our housing crisis? We ain't got enough houses. We need more built. What do we do? Well, in economic terms, it's very simple. We just need to release a lot more land and make it a lot easier. Uh, there are, I mean, de developers want to build. That's never been the problem. Uh, it's just that we ration land supply. We we uh, have a, a, almost a ban on building. We have basically uh, made it impossible to uh, to build 
in especially the big population centers. Uh, you have the green belts around London and uh, various other cities, which uh, where where building houses is completely abandoned. Much of it is not even literally green land. No, it's not. So People green always belt think is, it's is a bit a of a misnomer. They yeah. think it's sort of like the Cotswolds and it's gambling lambs, and it's not a lot of yeah. it is even brownfield site, and actually looked much nicer if it was developed. And 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 we need the land. But this thing, we're always told that oh, the developers don't want to build more properties. They want to keep the scarcity of the of new homes on the market. And they seem certainly in London to constantly just be building more homes that cost you know half a million plus for for foreign buyers or investment buyers rather than families who need homes and would quite like a garden every now and then as well. Well, it's true from uh, from the individual developer's perspective, there are certainly some people who have accommodated themselves in the system where they operate uh, on a business model where they build very little, uh, low volume, but high margins. But I would say we we simply need to get competition into this industry. And you do that by doing what I've just said, release more land and give planning permissions to, um, to others. Uh, I mean, the thing is, by rationing land supply in in the way we uh, we currently do and have been doing for decades, uh, in this way we have turned housing development, house building into an industry where you have extremely high fixed costs, yeah. and that means that. In practice, only a small number of big players can realistically operate in that market. So that but it doesn't need to be that way. But that's the thing. You've got loads of people who want to buy houses, who want a new want a home, yeah. um, and, and people with money, and they, and they can't get hold of one. We've had this massive, massive cut in the supply. All of the solutions offered by government, whether it's Labour or Tories over the years, always seems to be another sort of discount or help for people to get on the housing market. It never yeah. seems to actually build new homes. And even when we get people saying, we are going to build some new homes, we're talking about in the thousands never in, let's face it, the millions that we need. We've had 10 million more people in this country. We already had a housing shortage before they arrived 20 years ago. And, and yet we've not built enough homes for these people. Where is everyone living? Well, we've had a succession of housing secretaries that uh, have made the right noises, say, issuing yeah. white papers where they say, we're going to build more, we will start a building revolution. And uh, I think some of them really had the right instincts and wanted to get something done. It's so just that as soon it? as as soon as they run into NIMBY opposition, ah. they immediately panic. And um, even when you have reformers in government, they are isolated within their own parties. But obviously, aren't some of the problems that I'm not, I've opposed to some planning developments in my local area because frankly, they're completely out of you know, you know, fitting with the, the local environment. There, there are far too many. There's no parking for them. And I just thought they're just inappropriate. Isn't it just a lot of the planning developments that are suggested, certainly within towns and cities, are really ugly and really inappropriate? I would rather say um, that that is itself a consequence of rationing land supply, because if you make land extremely expensive, then that means developers have to cut, cut corners somewhere else. And uh, aesthetics, beauty, those are the things that you would sacrifice if um, the main input factor, which is land, is so expensive. If we had cheaper land, then uh, there would be more money left to uh, to, to upgrade that, it visually. And that, yes, and also that will help boost the economy. Um, really good to talk to you, Dr. Christian Niemitz. Thank you so much for the Institute of Economic Affairs. Sorry it was so short. Um, uh, just a really brief word from Philip Ingram. Look, you know, loads of people, they can't move, they can't afford to have a family, they, they, they can't change their job because they simply don't have the housing. This is such a key issue. It is a key issue. And I, I've heard before that a lot of the development companies have got land banks. Yeah. Maybe we should restrict how long they can hold on yeah, to those land banks. absolutely. And also, we're going to have to all stop being NIMBYs, aren't we? Uh, anyway, I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, lots more coming up. Uh, we'll talk about housing again. You know the mantra of this show, build more houses. I'll be bringing you uh, updates from the post office inquiry. Plus, is Europe ditching the electric car? Motorists always see said to the end. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong.
Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just yeah. for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer, you're with Talk TV. We're on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. I've been live from 10 all the way until 1. Where have you been for the last couple of hours? Well, coming up in this hour, plenty for you. The post office inquiry continues. Yesterday it was described as the greatest scandal that I've ever seen in the criminal justice process by a retired judge. In a couple of moments I'll be speaking to one of the key parliamentary campaigners for justice, the sub-postmasters, that's Lord of Buffett, who appeared yesterday. And the Labour Party has ahead of the SNP for the first time in a decade. That's according to a brand new poll. 33% of Scots plan to back Sir Keir Starmer's party, ahead of 31% for the SNP. And is Europe returning to petrol cars? Well, sales of Volkswagen electric cars are down by almost a quarter. This comes as UK data shows demand for petrol cars is rising faster than for electric ones. Uh, we'll talk about that and plenty more besides. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Katie Pilby. Thank you. A very good afternoon. The man police arrested over the fatal stabbing of a mum in Bradford while she was walking her baby in a pram has been charged with murder. Habiba Massoum was also charged with possession of a knife. He's appearing in court today. The US president has vowed to support Israel amid threats by Iran to retaliate for this month's deadly strike on its consulate in Syria. Joe Biden said the US commitment to Israel is ironclad and that it will do all it can to protect Israel's security. Well, it comes as the Israel military says it's killed three of the sons of Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh. All of them worked for the Hamas military. They're among the highest profile targets to be killed in Gaza so far. One person has been killed and five others injured, including two children, after gunmen opened fire in a residential area of Washington, D.C. Investigators, they believe the suspects, left a car and began shooting at people on the street. Police have issued a public alert for the car that fled the scene.
we're working v tirelessly to, to really help remove some of these illegal guns that are on our streets. We're working with our ATFs. We're working with some of our task force. Um, what we're seeing is an increase of guns in the district, and we're doing everything we can to ensure that we're removing those guns off of our streets. Meanwhile, Donald Trump has criticized Arizona's new abortion ban, saying it goes too far. The former president, who was in office when the historic Roe versus Wade legislation was overturned, which means women in the state could be jailed for getting an abortion unless it's to save the mother's life. Trump's criticisms come just days after he released a statement saying abortion rights should be left to the U.S. states. Nearly half of NHS staff are looking for a new job outside of the service. Well, figures released today found 47% of people have spent time looking at job adverts to leave the NHS, while around a third had actively inquired about it. Former Health Secretary Stephen Dole told Talk TV it's right to criticise the NHS for its failings. People speak very highly of the working environment in, one, in some hospitals. But you can have other hospitals down the road where that isn't the case. Now, looking, looking at an organisation or a set of organisations, more accurately, that employ one and a half million people, there are some parts of it that are very good and there are some parts of it that aren't as good as they should be. And police officers in Oxfordshire say they've been left confused by a copycat which turned out to be a bird. Take a listen. Well, Thames Valley Police said at first they thought their cars had developed a fault, but after some investigating, it turned out to be just a vocal starling, a bird known for its ability to mimic. That is the latest news for now. Let's get some weather with Nazanin Gaffana. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. Plenty of sunshine to be had across much of the UK for this afternoon, but not everywhere. Across southern areas of the UK, we've got a cold front that's lingering. That's bringing with it cloudier skies at times and some patchy light rain and drizzle. And it won't be a blue sky day for many areas. There will still be some cloud floating around, but there will be some good spells of sunshine for most of Scotland, Northern Ireland, England and Wales away from the south, where it may stay quite murky as well. And in the sunshine, it is feeling pleasantly mild. In fact, we could see the highest temperature of the year so far around some parts of East Anglia or the East Midlands up to around 19 to 20 degrees Celsius. If it gets close to 21, it will be the highest of the year so far. Overnight, it remains mild. We are seeing spells of rain moving across much of Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Northern England for a time as well, perhaps for the northwest of Wales. But the rest of England and Wales staying mostly dry. And as I said, a very mild night again. Tomorrow will be another mild day, but this time across northern and western areas, it will stay unsettled with outbreaks of showery rain over Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Northern England at times. The rest of England are well seeing some good spells of sunshine and temperatures slightly higher than today. Locally, they could get up to 22 degrees Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley Brewer, and you are with Talk TV. Still with me going uh, through all the biggest uh, stories of the day is former senior military intelligence officer Philip, Philip Ingram. Um, Philip, the question we've been asking our audience today, because actually it's a weirdly bitty day, you know, possible outbreak of World War Three. Small matter. Or a, a tiny matter. It's a regular yes, thing exactly. most Thursdays yeah, exactly. when you come in. We, we <laughs> seem to have a possibility of that with Iran uh, and in Israel. Um, and, and, and of course, you know, we've got that cash report and all the other events. We've got the post of inquiry we're going to talk about in a couple of moments. But um, health issues, still a massive mm. issue, massive issue at the next election. We know, um, you know, it's the economy. And can you get an NHS appointment for you, your kids, your, your, your elderly parents, or whatever? And it does seem to be a massive postcode lottery. Now, yeah. today we're asking about this NHS hospital waiting list. They came out at 9.30 this morning and they were hailed, you know, as, oh, fifth month they've fallen in a row. Yay. But I mean, by tiny amounts, we're looking at 7.54 million appointments being waited for by some six and a half million patients. So a few of them have got more than one appointment. But I mean, huge numbers of people waiting for healthcare. This will include healthcare like, oh, you know, cancer treatment, 
things like that, heart operations, things like that. And as we've had callers uh, today and people texting and tweeting about having horrific waits for them or their family members uh, for treatment, I want to know, are you confident that you and your family can get the health care you need? in a timely fashion. Tell us your experience. Tell us whether it's been good, whether it's been bad. It's interesting, a whole variety of different experiences. Some people, you know, I had a great experience, but you know, my son had a terrible experience. Give us a call, 0344 499 1000, text on 8722, or you can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text costs one, standard network rate message. Um, Philip, I mean, you talked before on the show about having cancer mm -hmm. treatment, um, and it is extraordinary. There are, there are some treatments in some areas where People just get rushed here. And I've got numerous family members uh, who, who've had treatments. They've been really, you know, really impressed with. And then we had a terrible experience with a, a close family member of mine in terms of a heart problem where the NHS abjectly failed us. And we were just incredibly lucky to have the money to mm -hmm. be able to go private and get things resolved. Um, still quite angry about it, as you can probably tell. Um, it, the thing is, it does seem to depend what your ailment is and which hospital you go in, yep. and who's on duty at the time, yep. and where you live. Yep. That shouldn't be what a national health service does. It, it, it shouldn't be, and we don't have a national health service. We've got you know, d different national health services in each of the nations of the UK. And as you point out, these um, are NHS and, and, England, and, yeah, figures, and I believe the figures are worse in Scotland and in Wales. Yeah, exactly, and, and therefore, when we see people politicising it to try and score political points, what they're not doing is they're not focusing on the actual real issues that there are there. The postcode lottery is down to you know, overall management, whether that be management management at NHS England level or whether it be management at individual trust level or in individual hospitals within within trust level uh, and it's probably a bit of all of it the whole yeah. way through and making I think, sure that I the think right there's a management there. issue that is we, we can see it was something Victoria Atkins the health secretary was uh, talking about this morning on a media round ahead of these figures coming out um, I don't never understand why people do things ahead of figures like yeah. that the chance of doing an interview you know three days before the budget what, what why are you doing that why don't you do it that you know the next Immediate, day? immediately after exactly yeah. but um, but but she was you know saying that you know, he, he, we're trying to spread spread best practice. So you've got you know, two hospitals, often in you know, very similar er um, uh, uh, you know, demographics, or even in the same area. Yeah. And they're just having completely different health uh, outcomes. Different outcomes, exactly. And, and this is where there, there needs to be, I think, to get the waiting list down, there needs to be a contingency fund that's put there where if someone comes in and they've got something that's urgent, then if there aren't the facilities in the hospital to get it done, get it done privately, and the NHS pays for it. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Except that's, that's his, providing... his issue, and again, I mean, people should be able to spend the money how they want. The reality is, the, you know, it is the public that has basically... You know, we, we, we pay to... Um, uh, to actually train up all the dogs yeah. in the NHS and yeah. most of the private ones as well, yes. by the way. Oh, yes. uh, most of those come from the NHS. And a lot of those doctors, it's not like they used to be in the NHS, they, or the radiographers or the nurses, they work in the NHS part-time. We only private, pay them yes. for Monday to Friday or Monday to Thursday mornings. And then in the afternoon, they're off to Harley Street in Central yeah. London or wherever, and then they're doing it for a huge, huge fees. Now, when, when an NHS doctor says, I can't see you for three months, but if you can come on Wednesday, if you pay me, you know, 400 quid, um, wouldn't it be more, wouldn't it make more sense if we just paid those doctors out of NHS funds? Well, it's, it's it's not a few down, less bureaucrats, not, not, a few less people yeah. worrying about diversity. But but, it, but it's, it's not yes, it's not just down to the doctor's salary. It's down to the fact that you know, the private hospital won't have the um, the, the the bureaucrats. Uh, and they'll have a more efficient system that's there to do the diagnosis, to get the admin right, to make sure you've got the right nurses um, yeah. and, and you need consultants and all the rest of, all, all the rest of, to enable the doctor to be able to do the work because everything is focused on the output um, and that's better management yeah well i would like to know everyone in the nhs what have you done today that has meant that someone else has someone has lived or has lived is going to live longer or is it was, was healthier and feeling better today yeah. and if your job doesn't impact any of that i'm not sure you should be in that well exactly job. all the doctors and nurses are doing that but but yeah. there's you know there, there's I've seen re recruitment advert uh, advertisements oh, okay. for diversity and inclusiveness individuals that are being paid more than nurses. It's ridiculous. Oh, mate, two or three times yeah, more. Exactly. It's absolutely ridiculous. astounding. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Do get in touch. 0344 499 1000 is the number uh, to call uh, on, on that. Um, I, I do want to hear from you. Uh, calls are charged at the national rate. Text cost one standard network rate message. Moving on now, though, the post office inquiry continues. Yesterday, it was described as the greatest scandal that I've ever seen in the criminal 
justice process by a retired judge. As we saw more than 900 sub-postmasters and sub-postmistresses uh, facing prosecution. We saw uh, people losing their jobs, their livelihoods, their homes, their families, their marriages, some even taking their own lives. Well, of course, it was the Mr Bates versus the post office drama on ITV over Christmas that really brought this to public attention. Although many journalists, I mean, including me, are paying, you know, just done it, covered it a couple of times, had been talking about this story, but there never seemed to be any movement on it. Finally, when the public was outraged when they found out what had really been going on and the impact on people's lives, there has actually been some movement, some action. But as we heard from Mr Bates himself, Alan Bates, uh, uh, earlier in the week, not very much. Well, I'm joined right now by one of the key parliamentary campaigners for justice throughout this period, and that is Lord Arbuthnot. James Arbuthnot was an MP during that time and was a leading uh, figure in this. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Lord Arbuthnot. Um, well, you gave um, evidence to the inquiry yesterday uh, and, uh, well, you know, very explaining exactly how bad things were and about how actually you had to withdraw all cooperation at one point uh, with the post office because they were clearly uh, not being, should we say, honest actors uh, in trying to resolve these issues. Today we've been hearing from uh, the uh, former managing director, um, uh, and that is uh, uh, um, David Smith. Um, he's previously been accused of telling an accounting, accounting chief in the post office to basically try and find, you know, put a, put a sheen on this, this scandal to make it look better. Um, are you confident that this inquiry is getting to the truth? Oh, the inquiry is doing, I think, a very good job, yes. Uh, I have uh, been really impressed by the diligence, the speed, the knowledge that Jason Beer and Wynne Williams have been showing in really getting to the bottom of things. And so these, uh, these I'm the, the encouraged. These are, the, these are the lawyers yes. asking the questions. Yes. Jason, Jason Beer is the, is the uh, lead counsel Council. for the inquiry and Wynne Williams is the chair, uh, the chairman of the inquiry and uh, they're, they're both doing really good jobs, as are, as are the rest of them. Yeah, indeed. I mean, it's been a long time since, you know, going on for years, this inquiry. And as Alan Bates said earlier in the week, you know, we, you know, he's still trying. I mean, he's the man who led, you know, the, the, the campaign and he's still trying to get compensation and get and get things resolved. Um, is the post office still dragging its feet? And do you agree with um, uh, Mr Bates when he said, you know, basically you need to you know, just just literally sell the whole thing off? No one at the post office should still be there. Well, I'm not sure that selling the post office to Amazon for a pound, which is one of the things he's yes. uh, suggested, would necessarily preserve the network of post office community hubs that are so essential to our communities up and down the country. Um, it's an interesting idea. And even even Alan is not absolutely convinced. No. It was kind of a throwaway Amazon... remark, wasn't it? But yes, in terms he's of not everyone at the Amazon top, is very keen to buy it. Yeah, no, exactly. It's pound bargain. But but um, actually, probably not big big losses. But in terms of you know the the number of people who've been involved from you know previous you know boss Paula Venels, who's going to be questioned in, in a couple of months, when well, a month and a half's time, and others that there have been so many people involved in the cover up of this scandal with the Horizon computers that you just simply can't trust anyone in operations of the post office to work with either the inquiry, the government, or indeed the victims of this scandal to actually bring them to justice. Well, it is true that I do require corroboration from various different sources before I believe anything that the post office tells me. And the post, the, the the inquiry has got exasperated, understandably, with the post office for its failures in disclosure, which is, which is an ironic thing, given that the inquiry is about the failures of disclosure to the <laughs> sub postmasters. So nothing's changed, even with the inquiry, even with all the expose of this. Things are still just as bad in terms of the ability, the willingness to cover up. Everyone is basically covering their backs and the backs of their colleagues. I don't agree. I think things are changing. Okay. Uh, I think Mr Bates versus the post office, that wonderful drama at the beginning of January, really galvanised both the country and the government. Yeah. And that's really good. And as a result, we're seeing new legislation that is going to exonerate 
hundreds and hundreds of sub, sub postmasters, and that is going itself to trigger a lot of re redress payments going to the sub postmasters. Yeah. So w we're getting somewhere. The minister, Kevin Hollenrake, I am actually pretty confident, is working very hard to cut out the bureaucracy that is in the way of paying sub postmasters the money that they should yeah. be paid. And then we move on to the business of holding to account the people in the management, in the lawyers, in the government that uh, were the cause of all this in the first place. Well, indeed. And in Fujitsu. Well, I was say. just going to say in Fujitsu as well. I mean, the big government ministers criticised for not dealing with it. They, they say, I mean, you've had you know, previous ministers, including now the Lib Dem leader, Ed Davey, saying, look, you know, I was told by the civil servants, I got, you know, I get letters from Alan Bates and people like that, and I'm told, no, no, there's not an issue. I mean, I've been lied to, it's not my fault. I, I, God, I, not very often I say this, I've got a sneaking sort of a sympathy for Ed Davey on that, but he obviously didn't look much further. He was the minister responsible for the postal services at the time. But again and again, and again, people in positions of power to do something didn't act. They had the wool pulled over, uh, over their eyes as well. But we know there was a clear cover-up by, by the post office that we know from internal whistleblowers. They did know there was a problem with these computers. They did know they could be uh, accessed remotely. That, that was something that was... You know, people were told in court they, that couldn't happen. They knew that people were being wrongly accused and convicted and even going to prison for, for a crime they simply did not commit. And there's been this massive cover-up also of Fujitsu. An extraordinary situation. They made this computer system, which clearly had massive problems. We've had whistleblowers again saying that they knew about it. Um, and yet they've been offered, they've been given huge numbers of government multi-billion pound contracts since. I believe they run our HMRC system, don't they? I mean, good Lord. Um, I mean, we haven't seen the full sort of impact of this yet. And we probably won't until we have, I mean, not just civil cases, but criminal cases against some of the people involved? Would you expect that to happen? Oh, definitely. Definitely criminal cases. Um, it, yes, ministers were all too credulous of what they were being told by the civil servants. It is possible that civil servants were all too credulous about what they were being told by the post office. But I'd like to know more about exactly how high the information from the post office went, because we now know that Paula Venels, for example, was told that remote recordings were possible. Mm. Uh, the, sorry, the remote access to sub postmasters accounts were, uh, was possible, yeah. even while she was telling me and other MPs that it wasn't. So uh, there were a lot of MPs who did not believe what they were being told by the post office or by the civil servant or by the ministers and in the end it took the drama to blow the doors off and, yeah absolutely uh, and, and it really did it, and it was an absolute game changer with the public finally understanding and also it's a very complicated story and it, it made it really really understandable i was i was so impressed with it it really was a, 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 amazing that yeah. difference i mean we had yesterday we've had the former post office managing director david smith he had a role uh, the role in 2010. They seem to have gone through a lot of people, didn't they? Um, and he says that the trouble is, during that time when a lot of this was coming forward, the board was focused on the separation of the post office and Royal Mail, rather than what on earth was going on uh, with post office, postmasters and postmistresses. He says, I'm sad to say at the time, I didn't really reflect on it in the way I should have done, he said, when we found out, you know, all these prosecutions were going on. But he did apologise and said he understands the anger and upset caused uh, after he congratulated the organisation's legal team following the imprisonment of a sub mistress, Seema Misra, who was pregnant at the time. And, of course, this was featured uh, in uh, that ITV drama. Uh, in his witness statement to the inquiry, uh, Mr Smith had said, it was intended to be a congratulatory email to the team, knowing that they had worked hard on the case. However, knowing what I do now, it is evident that my email would have caused Seema Misra and her family substantial distress to read, and I'd like to apologise uh, for that. Yeah, I mean... Do, do you think, you know, I mean, the reality is they didn't really care, did they? At the time, they didn't really care that there were people going to jail and losing their livelihoods, some in some cases taking their own lives. They, 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 they kind of had an idea it was happening, but it didn't bother them. Do you think that's a fair summary? Yes, I do. But it's also a total lack of common sense. 
uh, to believe that a computer program can be so error free that it can give rise to uh, the, the numbers of prosecutions yeah. that were going on. What, did, what on earth were they thinking about these people that they themselves had vetted as being <laughs> useful and very helpful community leaders suddenly turning into a bunch of criminals? Yeah. I mean, I, I, the directors, the directors should have been looking at this yes. all over this. They should have been asking what legal advice they were getting about these complaints about miscarriages yeah. of justice. The whole thing is ridiculous. That's, that's one of the things that very, struck very me, worrying. that they, they suddenly had all these people, you said they'd been very, very strictly vetted to become a, a sub postmaster. I um, mean, you know, CRB checks and all of that, you know, uh, what they were, whatever they're called this week. Um, and, and, you know, you have to have a blemish-free, you know, uh, character. And, and all these people suddenly are on the take, two grand here, 20 grand there or whatever. And, and I did wonder, you know, what was the jump? They put in this computer system, suddenly they were having a massive load more of of people who, who, who ran uh, these post offices, um, apparently, who were on the take and who were criminals and, and thieves. Um, and obviously their reasoning was, huh, imagine, we, we, we weren't able to catch all these people before because we didn't have a computer system. But of, you know, a huge percentage of the people who work for us are basically thieves. I mean, it's an extraordinary judgment to have had as opposed to, hold on a minute, we're suddenly finding a lot more people. Maybe there's something wrong with our computer system. Yes, I mean, it, it wasn't very difficult for me to form the judgment that yeah. Joe Hamilton was honest. I did that in about 20 minutes. Yeah. And if they'd actually, just by meeting her, you uh, you can tell that she's she's not a liar. And so if they had had some sort of human interaction with these people who were the backbone of the post office, maybe they would have done rather better. Absolutely. Lorna Buffman, thank you very much indeed. Always appreciate you coming on the show. And I know many people appreciate the work that you did as, a, as an MP and since uh, to try and campaign for justice on this issue. Thank you. Um, still with us uh, is Philip Ingram. Um, we're waiting to obviously to hear, we'll hear from Paula Venels, the former chief exec and other figures. And, and I, don't, I don't want people to become sort of individual hate figures because this was, I hate that phrase, systemic, but it was. Everyone across yeah. the board was involved in this cover-up. Although if you're the person paid the big bucks, I'm afraid you have to take, you know, get carry the can but it is extraordinary this went on for so long and and only a few good people like Alan Bates and and, and Lord Abosna you know were actually trying to campaign to stop it it is and you you can see the management and the ministers and anyone with oversight getting into this group think that everything they've been told yeah. is right do you want the really sad thing I'm seeing this in other departments and other areas yeah. across government as well, and in particular with regard to veterans. And I'm getting cases you know, put sent to me on a daily basis where similar things are happening out of Veterans UK. That could be the next big scandal. That, yeah, indeed. Comes. Well, again, look, we've seen you know we've seen these scandals where this this need to sort of urge to cover up reputations happens in hospitals when babies are being yep. murdered. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's not the same as someone losing their life. And babies are being murdered by yeah. a nurse, and there are suspicions. Oh, can you keep quiet about that because? reputation of the hospital might be damaged. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if, the, if, people are, if people are working in, and again, it's public sector, are willing to cover up that, mm -hmm. what won't they cover up? We have a massive systemic issue in terms of whistleblowers uh, being, you know, losing their job. We see this, we, and, look, and, we, look, we comes back to Tavistock yeah. and, the, and the cash review. And, and across um, and, all and departments. Tra across every department, against every yeah. area, and I think it, it happens in the private sector as well. Ooh, it's not unique to the public sector at all. But it is extraordinary that this still happens. And we, I, I've said this again and again when it comes to, you know, hospital managers and covering up, and whether it's a you know, post office and, and, and in, in Tavistock or whatever. We've got to start seeing people going to jail. Yes. It, it's there, there, the Grenfell Tower. There has to be, there has to be accountability. The, there There's be. no accountability and it's for not, decisions. And it's not making people scapegoats. It's just the people who make these decisions, they're paid a lot of money yeah. usually, and they need to live the consequences. And people go, oh, well, it doesn't matter because it'll be a committee decision. On the, no one will notice. People need to own the decisions they make and know that they are not putting people's lives at risk so or there's, livelihoods there's some, at risk. There's someone at the top who's paid significantly more than everyone else who gets a significantly bigger pension. In return who get, who for... Gets, who gets bonuses in return for... Carrying the can. Carrying the can, absolutely. So some have to carry the can. Well, might be carrying the can behind bars at some point. Who knows? Uh, Philip Ingram, thank you very much indeed. Uh, talking more about the uh, health service, though, we're asking you about those latest NHS hospital waiting list figures. They came out at 9.30 this morning. And guess what? Woohoo! Uh, we are seeing waiting lists go down. They've fallen for a fifth month in a row. Now there are only 6.5 million people waiting for 7.5 million patient treatments. I know. It's amazing, isn't it? First world country. 
billions being taken in tax, and that's that's us celebrating. I want to know, are you confident that your family and you yourself can get the health care you need? Tell us your experience. Uh, give us a call on 0344 499 1000, whether it's good or bad. Text on 87222 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Perry has done just that and says, is this reduction linked to the post-COVID excess deaths? They're no longer on the waiting list because they're on the excess deaths list. Zach says, I can't even get a doctor's appointment. Six months I've been trying to call my doctor's surgery. And Tim says, I won't go to hospital. They can't be trusted. That's silly. You need to go to hospital if you're ill. That's a good thing. I don't, I don't understand those sort of messages. Uh, you've also been getting a touch on the phones. Keep those calls coming in. Let's go to Tony, who's in Norwich. Hello, Tony. Hi, yeah. Hello. What do you want to say? Yeah, I'd like to say to you, Louis Farouk made a programme in 2015 called yeah. Transgender Kids in America. OK, you're talking, okay, okay, so we're talking about the trans issue uh, rather, than, rather than the NHS care you've experienced. Yeah. Right, well, OK, I didn't right, realise that. Apologies. I thought you were searching to run me back for it. Anyway, yeah, this was, this, this was like teenage girls obviously getting, like, uh, puberty blockers, whatever, and that. Yeah. And uh, the other thing as well is I got offered, I got offered gender reassignment when I was 15 because I was confused about my, about my sexuality. Yeah. And, and they said I'd have to wait till I was 18 if I could start having any treatment. Yeah. I never, obviously, I never went through with it. Obviously, I'm still a male, whatever. Now, but it's just like now, when you hear about these youngsters getting puberty blocks and treatment, I think there's in that against the law. Well, yeah, you, you think it will. I think it, it will be a now. But, that, but that's the thing. So, you look, you were confused. Do you say you were confused about your sexuality or about your gender ID? Because, you know, so thinking you were gay or straight is different from... Th say that again? About my sexuality, my gender ID. I so was both. 15 at the time. Right. So you, you sound like you're quite, um, I would say, quite understandably angry about this. So you're glad that you weren't sort of pushed onto that treatment railroad early on, whereas other kids have kids now would have been. Well, that's, well this was back in 1986, though. So I mean, so you can imagine. I mean. Yeah. So I yeah. mean, are you are you are you happy with how things worked out for you? I am actually, yeah, at the end of the day, yeah, I'm quite content with my life away from that, yeah. Good, good. I and mean, that's the worry, isn't it, that there are so many youngsters who weren't given that opportunity to just, you know, a lot of, lot of, lot of young people are, un are confused about their bodies, their, their mental health, their sexuality and things like that uh, in, their, in their teenage years. There's a lot of hormonal changes going on. Just need to sometimes, it's a phrase, like, kind of grow out of it. I mean, I know, I, I mean, I know people like I know transgender people. People have had the gender reassignment, as they call it, yeah. And I mean, they're lovely people working for that. I mean, but they've they waited till they've been an adult before they had the actual assignment done. Yeah, and that's the key difference, isn't it? I really appreciate getting in touch. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate that. Um, coming up after the break, uh, going to talk about the Labour Party surging ahead of the SNP for the first time in a decade, according to a new poll. What implications for that? I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You are with Talk TV. It's still with me in the studio uh, is my guest, um, Philip Ingram. And lots more to talk about in terms of politics. And of course, we've got an election this year, Philip. Is there? Yeah. Oh, that I hadn't heard. There's, there's 60 across the world. 60 yeah. across the world. But ours is the most important. We're, having, we're having two. <laughs> we're having two. Yeah. Oh, yeah, local, we've got local, local elections, elections and then coming the up very election. soon as well. Well, yeah. we've also got polls pretty much every single day. And according to the latest poll, the Labour Party has surged ahead of the SNP uh, in this in Scotland for the very first time in a decade. That's according to the latest poll that says that 33% of Scots plan to back Sir Keir Starmer's party ahead of 31% for the SNP. Well, joining me right now to discuss this is Neil Hanvey, MP. He's uh, for the MP for the Alaba Party, previously of the SNP. He's the leader of their Westminster group as well. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us, Neil. Pleasure. Um, Julia, I have to say... Um, very interesting poll, this. Um, no doubt it was a little bit of a schadenfreude on your part, seeing the SCP go down in the polls. I mean, this has pretty much happened, well, mostly since Nicola Sturgeon left office, uh, beginning to happen while, before she left office, but certainly yeah. under Humza Yousaf, um, the polls seem to be uh, going only in one direction for the SNP. Yeah, I, I mean, what's the, the interesting counterpoint to that, of course, is that uh, support for independence continues to hold steady and, and even some unfavourable pollsters are now placing support for independence above 52%. So it's not uh, a, a loss of faith in the cause of independence that is causing the SNP decline. Uh, it really is a, a whole range of political uh, and policy disasters that they have lurched from. And, and that really, that uh, um, uh, slate of policies really began under Nicola Sturgeon's tenure. So, uh, you know, her hands are certainly far from clean over the, the, the current disaster for the SNP. But, yeah. uh, but it's a bit like the situation down south where one of the strongest arguments that the Labour Party have is that they are not the Conservatives. Uh, and <laughs> the same is sadly true in Scotland where the strongest campaign uh, message that the Labour Party have in Scotland is that they're not the SNP. Uh, that's not a particularly strong prospectus for any uh, incoming uh, government. Uh, however, not that as is bad the as them. reality. That is <laughs> well, the political reality. I mean, the, the conventional wisdom for a very long time in terms of Labour's chances of getting back into Westminster were about, look, you know, they can't they can't do it if they haven't got seats in Scotland. The number of seats they used to win in Scotland was so crucial to any majority they have. Given where they are flying high in the polls across England and Wales, actually not needing perhaps those seats in Scotland so much. But this is a game changer in terms of Scottish politics, in terms of you know the Scottish devolution, you know the, the possibility of you know of Scottish independence. Now, that, even though you were the different party, you now the Alba Party led by Alex Salmond, you are still very much in favour of independence. You ain't getting independence without the SNP. So, do, are you sort of in two minds about this? Well, no, because look, uh, we all understand that politics is about ebb and flow. That's just the nature of uh, democratic discourse. Uh, you know, one 
uh, one day your your numbers are up, the next they're down, uh, and that happens uh, continuously over a period of time. I think there's a, a strong feeling within the independence movement that change is, is, is absolutely necessary at the, the top, and I, I mean right at the very top and all the way down into the upper echelons of the SNP because uh, they are uh, ultimately responsible for uh, their failure in government. I mean, it's across a whole range of issues. The fact that they're obsessing about niche, niche issues whilst at the same time yeah. not looking at uh, really important economic issues like saving Grangemouth oil refinery uh, and all of the jobs and uh, economic activity that depend on that, that's been left uh, uh, largely to the Alapa party and uh, our campaign has been led by my colleague in Parliament, Kenny McCaskill MP. Uh, so uh, that's the frustration. And, uh, you know, a bit like the Rutherglen uh, by-election, uh, the Labour Party won that victory uh, with Michael Shank. Uh, as much on uh, uh, opposition to the SNP, but also so many uh, uh, so-called nationalist supporters didn't bother to turn out to vote. And that might be the biggest problem that the SNP uh, face is that the support for them as the party of independence is significantly waning and more and more people are now looking for an alternative leadership in the independence yeah, movement. I mean, We're I'm, ready to step forward and take up. I'm sure uh, you are. Uh, but again, what, what is fascinating, as you say, you mentioned like all these sort of fringe topics and obsess, you know, their obsession with, you know, trans issues and diversity, this and all of this, you know, the ha new hate crime law. I mean, it is absolutely extraordinary, was it? You know, was it seven and a half thousand uh, hate crimes supposedly reported? Only a kind of 3% of them were actually thought to be actual crimes. A huge amount of police resources being spent on, you know, hurty words that, that weren't actually crimes. Uh, I'm sure about 7,000 of those were just reports about J.K. Rowling's tweets pointing out that uh, trans women are not women, they are men. Nothing hateful about that statement of biological fact. And she said, come and arrest me, I don't care. Now, it, the absurdity of all that stuff, when you've got, you know, falling uh, standards in schools, even longer waiting lists for healthcare, uh, in Scotland than in England, um, economy in a terrible state, you know, rising deaths from, you know, drugs and alcohol. I mean, there are so many things going wrong with the Scottish economy and Scottish sort of community life. It is extraordinary that the, these minority obsessions have become so important. But you and I both know they do matter to an awful lot of people. You know, half the population of women whose uh, who's safety and personal you know, safe spaces are being impacted by it. And of course, most of us have children and that concern we have about these so-called trans kids, no such thing as a trans kid, no child's born in the wrong body. You and I both know that. But it took the cash review yesterday to turn around an awful lot of politicians. Wes Streeting, the Shadow Health Secretary of Westminster for Labour, yeah. interestingly, you know, basically said, yeah, you know, I'm, I've, I think I've got a lot of this wrong. I'm turning around. Labour, you know, saying they'd support all the, the moves from the cash review. But one of the concerns of the cash review was closing down the Tavistock Clinic in London, um, uh, ending puberty blockers for um, under 18s across uh, the NHS in England, still available in private clinics, but also, crucially, still available in NHS Scotland clinics. Yeah. Talk to us about that. Well, um, it's quite interesting. So Joanna Cherry, who's a former SNP colleague, but continuing uh, friend of mine, uh, and uh, Robin Harper wrote to the uh, um, a clinical uh, medical officer uh, in Scotland this week, asking for a complete review of uh, gender identity services in Scotland, particularly for young people in light of the cash review. Uh, and that's one of the, the principal things that needs to be addressed. However, what I would say is that um, my colleague Ash Reagan in, uh, in the Scottish Parliament, I think, put it absolutely perfectly. Uh, when a, a government, such as the Scottish government's fingers are in their ears, their, their finger is not on uh, the pulse of public opinion. And, and sadly, that is where we are. I've written to uh, First Minister Humsey Yusuf and his minister several times uh, about the policy uh, slate that they are pursuing, particularly around conversion practices, which would effectively uh, formalise and legislate to make all of the disastrous uh, uh, medical malpractices that have been uncovered in the cash review formal uh, uh, government positions, which is an absolutely ludicrous position to be in. So there, there needs to be a wholesale review of these services across these islands, and I think there will be repercussions around the world. 
uh, in light of the uh, the detail of the the cash review but in terms of the labor party's position on this it's great that uh, west streeting has actually woken up to the very serious risks of queer theory ideology that exists uh, in public bodies but the Labour Party in Parliament are still uh, uh, um, uh, full of uh, people who are absolute diehard adherents to queer theory ideology. So the Labour Party need to have a serious look uh, at who they are putting forward for election if they are to be taken in any way. Yeah. as a credible defender of women's rights and young people's safety yeah, indeed. Uh, in regards um, to these issues. Can I ask you, your, you know, your, your, your fellow Scots uh, person, uh, J.K. Rowling, um, she, yeah. of course, has been magnificent on, on, on all of this, on the, the hate crime thing, on the trans children, in inverted commas, issue, and women's safety as well, and speaking out, and uh, has received the most extraordinary amount of abuse uh, and, uh, and criticism, being called a bigot and, and basically written out, you know, of polite society by uh, certain groups in the celebrity world, including some of the actors who she made millionaires by plucking them from obscurity <laughs> to uh, star in her Harry Potter films. Um, she has been asked, you know, been asked, you know, does she expect an apology from um, those actors who have criticised her for, uh, again, ne never being transphobic, not once, not one utterance, not one tweet, but simply talking about protecting women and girls and children's safety. And um, she said, no, they owe an apology to those who have been affected by the puberty blockers and who've tried to, well, wanted to detransition since. Um, she's right, isn't she? Well, yeah, she is right. And uh, I think the point that she made that was, um, you know, really reflects her values uh, so brilliantly was that she doesn't want an apology personally. It's the children who have been harmed and um, their lives have been potentially ruined uh, by these practices that the the people who were proponents of this uh, uh, crazy uh, movement uh, should apologize to and she's absolutely right you know i take absolutely uh, no comfort really on a personal level i'm not i don't feel like celebrating uh, the advent of the cash review it told me right. things that i knew uh, five six exactly. seven years ago uh, so there's no surprises there for me it just formalizes the concerns that many of us have held and um, you know, it's the young people that have been harmed that I am concerned about. It's it's them that we owe a real responsibility to act swiftly. We can't allow uh, uh, the, the last 20 years of concerns yeah. uh, to wait another 20 years for them to be corrected. I think Absolutely. one of the first things that I've called for is a major investment into child and adolescent men mental health services so Indeed. that the young people get, you can get the therapy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to have to leave it there. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, Neil Hanvey. Thank you so much okay. for joining us, uh, Alaba uh, MP there, uh, Neil Hanvey. Philip Ingram is still with me. Um, look, we talked a lot about mm. the cash review. I want to come back to that poll uh, showing Labour surging ahead of the SNP for the first time in a decade. It is extraordinary, that fall from grace for the SNP. 54% in the polls once under yeah. Sturgeon. Two, 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 two things come out of this. One, where a devolved government focuses on you know, a single issue, independence for Scotland at the cost of everything that yeah. is supposed to be lo 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 looking at, running services across the country, and the education, health and everything else suffers, then this is what happens. But the sad thing is that um, Labour aren't getting in or, or, or getting ahead in the polls because they're bringing out any new policies and stuff. It's just we aren't them. That is not a good way to yeah, have a government uh, of the future. It's very interesting, that, isn't it? Philip Ingram, thank you very much indeed. Well, we've been asking you about uh, the latest NHS hospital waiting list. They've fallen for a fifth month in a row. Woohoo! Yeah, they're only down to about six and a half million people waiting for a whopping 7.54 million uh, treatments. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Are you confident, I'm asking today, that you and your family can get the health care that you need? Tell us your experience. Give us a call 0344 499 1000, text 87222, or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Dex says the reality is it's a queue where you're prioritised. You will need to suffer or get worse before you climb the list. That's if you don't die first. Alan says, I waited months on end in agony just to be given medication to get through. My body became becomes more and more dependent on these pills now. It's disgusting. And Faith says, it's so far so good on my fast track cancer screening, but the communication is still erratic. We will wish you the best of luck on that. Uh, you've also been getting in touch on the phone, so let's uh, keep those uh, calls coming in. Uh, go to Roger, uh, who's in the Forest of Dean. Hello, Roger. Hello, good afternoon. Hello, thank you for getting in touch. What do you want to say about your experience with the NHS? 
Well, I've, I've, um, I didn't say your call before, but um, I've got two lots of cancer. I've got skin cancer. And I've also got blood cancer. And I've also yeah. had a recent hip replacement. Yeah. Um, regards to hip replacement, um, I was uh, first saw a consultant about two years ago, roughly, and I was about 22 stone. Yeah. Um, and he said, look, you've got to get down to BMI of 36. And I was a, a ridiculous BMI at the time. Anyway, I got down to it in December. Yeah. And I actually had the operation in February. Because their argument February. is there's no point giving you the operation unless you've lost the weight, otherwise your hip won't ever recover. So that's good. Yeah, you, and you, you felt you were given good care and good help losing Very, the weight? Yeah. Excellent. I've, um, I've got no qualms at all. In regards to my cancer, that I, um, I regularly speak to, um, speak to my consultant on that. I regularly get uh, blood tests. Yeah. Um, I also see the dermatologist uh, recently. I've seen the last, well, I've seen him yesterday. Yeah. Um, but I've got I've got no no qualms at all. I'm Brilliant. Just lucky so you're you're getting things. you're getting timely care, the good communication, everything's working well. I mean, the yeah. trouble is, is do you, do you find it extraordinary when you hear from other people who have almost the opposite experience? I know it, it's um, I, I, I know I know people because I used to be in the navy, so obviously it's all around the country and everything. Yeah. And a lot of people are saying, you know, how, how bad it is. But I'm just lucky that we live where we live, I think. Yeah, I know. That's the thing, isn't it? It shouldn't be luck, should it? We paid for this service. Oh, well, look, I wish you all the best, Roger, with all of your, your health concerns and uh, keep on getting to a healthy weight. It's, it's worth it, mate. It's worth it. It's good, for, it's good on every health ground there is going. Really appreciate you calling us. Thank you. And we say wish you all the best. Uh, coming up after the break, are we returning to petrol cars? Sales of VW electric cars are down by almost a quarter. This is Talk TV. I'm Julia. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to ab and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat, oh. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you? But laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Boo. You're with Talk TV. Last few minutes of my show. And let's ask Is Europe returning to petrol? Sales of VW electric cars are down by almost a quarter. This comes as the latest UK data shows demand for petrol cars is rising faster than for electric ones. Well, what a surprise. Motorists are very sensible. Uh, they know that electric cars cost an awful lot more and often aren't very reliable. Oh, yeah, and electricity costs are going up too. Imagine that. Well, joining me now to discuss this is a political theorist and economist at Webster University in Vienna, and that's Ralph Schulhammer. Good afternoon to you, Ralph. Good to be back, Julia. How are you doing? Very well, indeed. Well, I'm doing very well because um, I've got a diesel car. I don't care. We've got a diesel car. It's cheap to run. Barely ever use it, to be honest with you. Um, and I always figured, by the time they get to all this banning of the sale of this or that kind of car, they'll have realised that the motorists and the, the taxpayer won't put up with this nonsense anymore. But what do you make of these, le these latest figures showing that basically it's not just here in the UK, but across Europe, motorists are saying, yeah, yeah, we tried the electric experiment, the EVs, we're going back to petrol and diesel cars. No, it makes a lot of sense because very often EVs were secondary cars. They are particularly popular in urban areas where I believe, by the way, that they also make the most sense. But they were never particularly good in penetrating the rural areas where you have long distances, where the terrain is more rugged. And EVs at the current state are simply not attuned to these surroundings and that kind of environment. And the other thing is, as the so-called IC, the internal combustion engine ban, comes ever closer, people are, so to say, stocking up on uh, combustion engine cars because you can always get an EV down the road, but once uh, the IC is banned, it's going to be more you complicated. Be so if I would have the choice, I'd rather buy the IC, have one in reserve, yep. and then I see where everything goes. Yeah, absolutely. And we know, again, as you say, an awful lot of the electric cars that were sold, it was a big thing, they, they cost a fortune, um, they weren't as reliable, so a lot they were often people's second cars. So people who, you know, unless you desperately need a car for, mm. for getting around, certainly in major cities, people often don't. Um, it's it's a luxury, not, not a necessity. And they cost a heck of a lot more uh, than petrol and diesel cars. And most people are on a budget and, and can't afford that. But also, people like me, you know, I live in a flat. We, we, don't, we don't have anywhere to charge an electric vehicle. You have to go down the road. We did have an electric charging point for six months just outside. Uh, but, but then it, it broke and they never bothered replacing it. So, you know, quite bizarre. But, but this is the thing. For motorists are very sensible. Other than your home, your car is probably the biggest thing you're ever going to spend money on. And people don't want to waste money, do they? Yeah, real. And, and I think you made another very important point. We should not forget one of the reasons why cars have become such a permanent presence in our life is due to their reliability. Like I, I take the train a lot. I like to fly. I like to use public transport whenever possible. But if you need something, especially as a family, by the way, if you have little children, yeah. if you need to be mobile and something that is reliable, the car remains the best possible option. So people will not then switch from the reliable diesel car or gasoline car to a potentially unreliable EV. I think yeah. it's just a little bit absurd that that in the name of the environment or climate, people will get a less reliable yet more expensive car. Yeah. It's, it kind of defies it's common sense. And anyway, they're not better for the environment because, of course, you have to have electricity production somewhere and they take much more to produce. And, of course, the batteries don't last forever. What do you do with the batteries afterwards? There's a very big question mark about whether they are actually a better the environment overall. But also there's the other crucial, uh, crucial, crucial fact uh, is that whether or not we're ever going to see that ban on the sales of petrol and diesel cars because yeah. basically we've got you know these fines coming in for for uh, manufacturers, you have to sell a certain percentage of electric vehicles. Well, they're saying, but we can't. People don't want to buy them. You can't force people to buy things they don't want to buy. No, and it's even worse than this, right? If it is as superior as everybody claims, uh, people will buy it voluntarily. Like, we have no single example in the history of the markets where there is an absolutely superior product and the state had to force and subsidize yes. it because people refused to buy it. And the second thing is, on a more positive note, there is something that would be a good solution, and that would be hybrids. But unfortunately, one has to admit, the environmental lobby, for whatever reason, is pushing for the full battery vehicles. Yeah. Now, hybrids would be very good in many ways, exactly as you described. They have less of a resource use than full electric cars, and you, com you can combine the best of yeah. two worlds. But, but, but no, so that many be, things... Ralph, that would yeah. be sensible policymaking. They won't do that. Uh, Ralph Shawhammer, always exactly. so good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Just a couple of seconds for you, Philip Ingram. Have you got an electric car? Would you buy one? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, we're it's too early in the technology to get exactly when when they're all working we'll all buy them fine you don't exactly. need to force people to buy things that, if they're not that good philip pleasure as always to have your company thank you for joining thank us all today me. sadly we have come to the end of the show thank you so much for tuning in i'll be back with you on monday up next it's kevin and alex have a great afternoon i'm julia hartley brewer and you'll be talking to you
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! <laughs> it's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth plinth.